Good morning. It is Wednesday, April 26th, and uh, this is the Education and Culture Committee. Uh, our, we're continuing our work on the FY24 operating budget and CIP. Uh, and our we have several items today. Uh, our first is uh, community use of public facilities. Um, and we have, I see, the, the dynamic Ramona Bell Pearson here and her team, uh, Ms. Vanessa Lopez Cuevas, Acting Financial Administrator of CUP, and Alicia Singh, good to see you again from OMB, and our uh, amazing analyst Vivian Yao. So um, good to see everybody, and, and CUP obviously is, is really important to the use of, uh, the use of our, our facilities and our schools for community programs, and so I'm, we're, I'm sure we're all eager to hear how things are going. Um, and. Uh, what we have, uh, progress we've made. Um, after we deal with CUPS budget, we'll turn to MCPS for our second operating budget session. So with that, uh, I'll turn to Ms. Yao to walk us through the package. Good morning. For fiscal year 24, the executive is recommending total expenditures for CUP of $11,946,508. Uh, it's an increase of, of $464,778 or 4.4% over the fiscal year 23 approved budget. Council staff always likes to remind folks that CUF is supported by an enterprise fund um, and does not receive tax dollars to support its operations. And thus, you know, the recommendations in terms of how we review the operating budget from the council president don't really apply in that sense to CUF because we're not really, we're not talking about general fund dollars for the most part. So the table on the first page of your packet shows uh, the trends from fiscal year 22 to the fiscal year 24 recommended budget for total expenditures and positions. Council staff just wants to uh, correct one item in fiscal year 22. That's reported incorrectly in the packet and it's being changed in the packet online, but the amount for that should be $8,502,633. Um, so in terms of moving to the next page on r racial equity and social justice, the Office of ra uh, Racial Equity and Social Justice found that CUF demonstrates a strong commitment to advancing RESJ in the county um, as its submissions identified actionable efforts uh, in these areas. But it did raise a couple questions. One was, there was an absence of demographic data and targeted resource allocations that made it difficult to assess whether a racial equity lens was being applied in the activities indicated. And, and they also question, had a question about whether uh, or the extent to which staff sought input from community users to identify and assess gaps in the fee assistant pro assistance programs. And so the committee may want to uh, hear from CUF about those issues. Thank you, Ms. Yao. Uh, Ms. Pearson, any you can any general comments, and then obviously, yes, I would like you to address the issues Ms. Ms. Yao just raised. Thank you, um, Councilmember Gerondo. Ramona Bell Pearson, Director of Community Use of Public Facilities. Uh, it's nice to see you all this morning. Um, we will address the issue of the racial equity concerns that were raised. I can tell you that we have two mechanisms that are on our computer system that allow us to collect survey information. The first would be the website. Our website does make a request of reports for the, how the experience has been that is available for any permit holder, whether it's while they're doing the rec track or afterwards once their permit has been used to understand if they had any concerns or problems. Particularly, we have a complaint line uh, which is available uh, weekends and evenings. We have staff that works those and not only hears complaints but also inquires about the experience. So that is data that we collect and we do have a um, rec track splash page that has information or a link on it that allows people to have their input in terms of how their experience is. I will say as to the rec track splash page, that one specifically does attempt to collect data related to uh, racial, sexual uh, preferences or, or categories. Um, it, it is very um, informational, but it's also very optional. So we don't always get people that choose to divulge that information because there is an NA category, so you can say not applicable or you don't want to participate. Uh, we also have a process built into our facility fee assistance program where when you make an Ms. application. Chris, if you could just hold on. There's a 
question on something you just said from okay. Member Baker. Just wanted to clarify, when you said sexual preferences, did you mean gender identity? I do, yes, I'm okay. sorry. No, no problem, yeah, just wanted to make sure, very different things, just wanted to make exactly, sure. Exactly, okay, and I tried to you. correct that. That was okay. a slip of the tongue. No worries. So, um, with regard to our fee assistance program, um, on the grant application, we do ask what the targeted or the intended um, audience or community use is, and there is a requirement that they participate and uh, have a certain percentage of individuals from certain communities that we've seen are focused communities that we're interested in reaching. So that is one of the purposes of the grant and they have to identify that. At the conclusion of the permit use, they also have to report back and indicate how many actually did attend, which give us some demographics of from what community they came from, um, any other information particulars that they can are willing and able to divulge. Uh, and again, that depends on the participants willingness to allow to have that information. Um, so I do want, and, and with regard to the um, regular reporting, we do do pie charts and graphs to indicate based on our rec track numbers what those percentages look like in terms of the satisfaction level for uh, permit holders and, and other information. I think we get that on a monthly basis? A weekly basis. It's a weekly basis. So, you know, and, I, and I, it, this is a problem we deal with all the time, whether when it's optional, right, you know, or even if it's observed in the case of like policing, right, the, the, the race and ethnicity is the observed race and ethnicity, for example, of the officers. So, so it's never going to be perfect, but the, you know, what I'm trying to understand is it's, this says the absence of demographic data and, the tar and, and targeted resource allocations. So are we even reporting what you have whether, when, when people fill it out? That's, it, so is, are you representing that somewhere? Because this seems to suggest that you're not, I don't, and I haven't seen it, but. I wasn't involved in the study or the analysis that was done by the um, Office of Racial Equity. It could be that that information was not readily available to them, but we will make sure that they and have follow that. follow up, because I think, you know, what we're trying to get at here, obviously, is it's, it's not a gotcha. It's just like, what are the, as you know, the use of facilities and the work you do, we want to know who's getting access and, and is it equitable and how, how are we uh, focused on that? And, and we have to be intentional about it. So. Um, we'll ask, you know, Michelle, if you can help make connect the dots, and, and we can follow up. But um, even with what you have, you know, because that'll give a picture, a sampling of it. Sure. So, can I have yeah, Councilmember. Um, and also thinking about zip code and uh, the geography of, of folks who are getting access, and making sure that folks in their own neighborhoods are getting access to facilities that are in their in their own neighborhoods. Um, and that might also help us to identify, um, you know, facility needs. Thanks. Okay. Is there anything else, uh, Ms. Pearson, that you wanted to bring up related to, I noticed, you know, obviously we'll get to that, the revenues, Ms. Yao, did you talk about that already, the revenues? Uh, no, we haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten there yet. yet, so anything else you want to say at this point? No, okay. I don't think so. All right, Thank so let's you. continue, Ms. Yao. Okay, moving on. Um, the required changes in the CUF budget are included in the table on page two of your packet. Um, they include, you know, regular, regular uh, increases like annualization of the 23 compensation increases, motor pool printing, et cetera. Um, so the total amount of those is $99,010. Um, and if Do we, need, we can take, we can approve those, I think, without objection. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, Let's get into is, the fun part. <laughs> the MOU. Well, it's, I don't think it's, as, it's quite as complicated as it was after I the pandemic. Not. I hope not. Um, but CALP is mandated to reimburse MCPS for costs incurred and services rendered in making facilities available to the community. So a significant portion of the CUP operating budget is used to reimburse MCPS typically for these costs. And so the table on page uh, three of your packet shows the estimated reimbursement to MCPS for fiscal year 24, which is $6,271,356. Um, this is, a, it makes up about 85% of the cuffs, of cuffs operating expenses for fiscal year 24. Great, uh, yeah, that is much more straightforward than the past, but I think, Ms. Pearson, if you could just speak to, I know we have had my colleagues were not on the previous ENC committee, so we had a lot of talk about the MOU and when it would be done, and so it's done. 
Well, yes and no. Okay. All right. <laughs> it was a one-year MOU, right. and when it came time to renew, which we had built in an opportunity for um, each party to agree, and it would extend automatically, and finance made us aware that they wanted to have a little bit more detail with the signing uh, page. They wanted specifically the attorneys to sign off on it. And in the past, I don't know how many years we've had this MOU, that's never been the practice. Um, we do obviously consult with our legal offices, the very, you know, CUF as well as MCPS, but there was never a requirement that they sign off. Um, we submitted a new, a revised MOU to MCPS several months ago, and we've been waiting, and they've indicated that I think they've moved it along maybe to their legal office. I'm not sure exactly if you heard. Specifically well, we have is. a lot of MCPS. Is, <laughs> is, uh, is, is there anyone in the room, Dr. McKnight or otherwise, that can speak to the status of the MOU with CUP? No, or we can check on it if, if we don't know. Anyone in here? Okay. Okay, we'll follow up. So you're waiting, but the the material terms, though, it seems like there's agreement. On the, the material terms, there's there was an agreement from the old MOU, yeah. or by old I mean last year's right. to this year's, um, there were just a couple of changes, and especially the, the major one being the signature blocks. Um, and I did hear from Mr. Adams last week to say it was a priority. Um, they understand we have deadlines in order to be able to reverse, reimburse them within the fiscal year, so we're, we're hoping that, that things are gonna move quickly. Okay, great. All right, well, that's that's good to hear. Um, just if, if you're just saying, it sounds like you're saying there's just signatures that need to happen. There's no disagreement on the reimbursement rate or anything like that. That's all I've heard. Great. Okay, well, NMCPS said they will move that along and follow up so you can get it done below, before July 1. Um, okay, well, uh, I, any questions from colleagues on that? So uh, without objection, we'll recommend approval of those reimbursements. Great. Um, so moving on, for fiscal year 24 revenue assumptions, the executive is projecting total revenues of eleven million nine hundred and seventy-five thousand two hundred and forty-eight dollars for CUP in fiscal year twenty-four, which is an increase of about fifty five hundred and thirty-nine thousand. Um, council staff does note that the revenues for fiscal year twenty-three will fall short of the projected amount, and total revenue after the third quarter is about six million dollars, which is approximately two point two million dollars lower than the amount projected. Uh, from last year for this time. So the table on page three of your package shows the budgeted fiscal year 23 actual and then fiscal year 24 projections. And Ms. Bell Pearson, just contextualize this, what this will mean for you. Well, it, it means that permits are coming back. Um, I will say they're coming back slowly because, for example, we've experienced with the religious groups that traditionally permit with us. We used to have over 200 churches that would permit with us every week. We now have 50. It has significantly dropped off. Some of that is because the churches were small and disbanded, went back to other areas, but went back to brick and mortar churches. Some of that is churches have told us they're staying online, virtual. So we don't know if that is gonna come back, but the cultural schools are coming back. and. Um, We've always had a strong usage of the fields, even during the pandemic. As we all know, that was pretty much all people could do. Um, and, and I will say on that note, um, I, I failed to mention that earlier, we were very successful in reaching communities we have never reached before during the pandemic when it came to usage of the fields. And even when it reopened and we were able to use gyms because we had not only the ARPA funding, but there was an extension of another plus 100,000 100, plus uh, appropriated so that we could extend even further beyond the ARPA funds. That made a significant difference for those communities. And we're still trying to engage those communities, but it's gonna be difficult to have the same level of engagement without the additional funding. Um, we are working through the Out of School Time Committee, which I'm sure you've heard about, work group, uh, and with Collaboration Council, so that we can continue to reach those communities and set up some sustainability but again it's difficult because we're we're back to our original usual budget but not to get off point the permits are coming back so it means that we are increasing i think last year we ended in the negative seven mil seven hundred thousand five hundred thousand sorry i should let her talk i'm <laughs> but um this year we're going to have more of a, we're going to have a definite positive so that's what it means to us in terms of the revenue 
it's very positive. Great. Thank you for just wanting to do that for the benefit of the millions at home and my colleagues. But yeah, that's that's a good thing. And, and, and yes, I'm glad you mentioned the out of school time. We hope that as that moves forward, your budget will need to go up and, and so that, you know, or will go up rather because of the more use. Yes, Council Mayor Owens. Thank you. It's good to see you, Ms. Bellperson. And as I've said many times before, and we'll continue to say, I think uh, Cuff has one of the more challenging jobs in county government because you all are the middle people. Um, and so you're trying to facilitate so many different things that are out of your control, <laughs> but, and which sometimes leads to frustration. But I think all things being equal, this continues to be a model program. Um, because it does provide tremendous access, alleviates some of the administrative burden that existed prior to Cuff's existence. And as you stated, people are coming back and renting our county facilities, which are their facilities too, at higher rates. Uh, and so we are starting to see a lot come back. Um, just If you could just mention briefly, I think the fee assistance program um, and the marketing of that uh, could be another way of attracting and bringing back some additional users. Um, so as the county tries to meet them part of the way, if you could talk a little bit about the fee assistance program and how that's going. Sure, thank you. Um, we are we, we were very successful because the fee assistance program is where the funds I mentioned, the ARPA funds and the uh, additional appropriation went, which increased significantly the numbers we reached. However, I will also very uh, happily tell you we now have a communications uh, resource person, outreach person. Um, they will be starting next month. Um, I'm very excited about this individual. They're very uh, active with social media talents, with uh, being a former user themselves, well, I shouldn't say former, they're current user of our services, uh, as well as park services and rec services. So they're very familiar with the whole process. Um, they're very well educated as to cup and what we do. So we're looking forward to having them hit the ground running. Um, the facility fee assistance program, the CAP program at the Silver Spring building, as well as um, what we were talking about in terms of outreach to specific demographics um, and also working with the Office of Social and Equity, Social Justice and Equity. All of those are going to be uh, strong points that they're going to work on specifically. So I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised. However, I know I'm sounding like a broken record. We have 75000 that is given on an annual basis to the Facility Fee Assistance Program. We're still going to be limited mm -hmm. because of that. Um, we may have to do some adjustments before because we had more money. We were able to give larger, we, we set a ceiling for each group because most of the groups do programs year long. So they often need 20,000 or 10,000. So we'll give them a percentage of what they need. Um, but we set a cap of you know three or 2,000 for each group depending on their size and the community they're reaching. We may have to lower those caps for individual groups in order to reach more groups because if we're if we're left with the seventy five thousand, it's it's only going to go so far. I appreciate that, and there will be. I'm excited about the communications person, um, and there will be a new resource in the new sports committee that's been developed. Um, that we are, I think, the recreation department is finalizing the appointment of those positions, so that'll be another leverage point where we mm -hmm. can reach out to different community stakeholders and let them know about what's available. So, and we do have a representative assigned to that. Yes, yes, we made sure of that. Yeah, thank <laughs> so, you. Great, absolutely, thank you. Um, I also just wanted to add that um, the CUF is going, has uh, attracted or decided on a vendor to do the fee, a fee assessment. And part of that assessment, the joint, uh, sorry, the committee has been interested in exploring other ways of doing business to support priorities like mm -hmm. youth programming. So hopefully when the fee assessment comes back, there'll be some discussion about, you know, how do we increase these kinds of fee assistance programming um, to, you know, to various different programs in the community. Um, and it may involve perhaps more use of general funds to support these, again, because the rationale behind CUP is that those people who are using space pay for that use. Or, you know, um, but if we have folks in the community that are unable to pay for that use, then maybe general funds are the way to support that use. Mm -hmm. So, but we'll know more after the fee assistance, uh, 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 fee assessment is completed. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I think that absolutely will be the case. And, and I think 
it's proven by the fact that the fee assistance program, well, how soon do you normally, in a normal year, how, how soon do you expect to run out of that funds or allocate those funds? I think in a normal year, it's usually around February or March. Right, right. So there's still quite a bit of the fiscal quite, year quite left. Quite a bit of the fiscal year left. So something that we need to look at too, just going forward. So I, I will also just note as a caveat to the council, the the fee study is going to be a mixed bag because they're obviously going to come back and say fees need to increase. We haven't increased our fees in 15 years. Mm -hmm. So, and we're not even consistent with Rec and Parks, mm -hmm. who have made. Uh, upgrades to their fees uh, since the time that we haven't. So we're kind of, you know, at a oppositional situation where um, fees need to increase, yet we are concerned with having availability of uh, equity as to access. And if you increase the fees, then that obviously has an adverse effect on communities that can't afford already. Um, so it's it's going to be difficult, but we are going to be partnering through this fee study with Park and Rec so that we have consistency Good. in what we're doing. They've even expressed an interest in um, um, maybe even bridging a contract or at least being advocates to work with and give input to the study. I, well, I would, you know, I'm a member of the Planning, Housing, Parks Committee. I would strongly recommend, and I'll talk to my colleagues there too, that they end to Director Riley and that they uh, do that. I think it, you, you want to make sure. I don't think the public, and, not, and I don't think I know the public makes no distinction, right? <laughs> with whether they come through through Rec or Cup or how they're getting the the place. And you're right; it's going to have to be a balance of how do you maintain the integrity of the in, the enterprise fund, but how do we make sure there's access? And it's going to be we're going to have to have that kind of a policy discussion of. What do you need to maintain and to move forward, and how do we make sure people can come in? So that'll probably be a mix of general funds and the adjustment, but we'll see. Councilmember Albanos. Yeah, this is a tough issue, clearly. I mean, inflation impacts all of us, and I mean, if you think about all of the proposed tax increases, uh, WSSE is proposing a 7% increase. I mean, just our, our residents are getting bombarded from in every direction. Um, we're discussing recordation tax, a property tax increase, and so, uh, we do need to look at this holistically and how it's impacting our residents. And it needs to not be a one-size-fits-all, um, because as you acknowledge, Ms. Um, Bill Pearson, we want to be very careful that we don't have the unintended consequence of preventing organizations who we desperately need to access these f facilities and creating yet another barrier for them to be able to enter them. Um, they, their, their tax dollars pay for these facilities, and this is a fee on top of that. So, um, it's a. It, it, I appreciate Chair Jawando's point that we are going to have to look at this holistically um, across the board, uh, and and have a responsible, phased-in approach um, that that is targeted um, and not a one-size-fits-all. Absolutely, Ms. Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on, there the packet talks about the fiscal plan, uh, CUPS, 20, fiscal year 24 to 29 public services program enterprise fiscal plan. And typically that's published in the budget book, but it was, didn't make it in this year, but it is provided at circle four of your packet. And there's a couple things that council briefed, you know, just pulled out of that to note. One is that Continued funding of 200,000 for the community access pilot program is included in the budget. Uh, that is again fee assistance for use of the Silver Spring Civic Building. I'm not sure it's so much a pilot anymore, but um, anyway, that's the name of it. Um, yeah, and, it's a policy. Um, and then the general fund is providing support for use of space for elections, um, as well as it contributes 25,000, which then is used for the fee facility fee assistance program. Um, and no contributions are programmed for CIP current revenue, which has in the past supported the ball field initiative. This was uh, one of the number of programs that was supported when the cuff fund balance was at, you know, kind of a higher than uh, ideal level. Um, and so those are some of the things to note in the fiscal plan. Appreciate that. Any, Ms. Bell Pierce, anything to add? No, I, um, I guess I did fail to mention when we were talking about the access 
um, especially with regard to the balance between the the fee study and potential increase in fees and the continued access for uh, certain communities that we haven't reached or aren't reaching or hope to continue to reach. I will also say that the executive is very concerned about the same things. Um, we do have a meeting set with him to specifically discuss that because he has indicated a very strong interest in continuing to reach communities that we either aren't reaching or just starting to reach and to make sure that there is a, uh, a lens on things that we do. So we will be meeting with him um, later next month. Great. Well, please keep us posted on that. You know, one of the best things about our county is you can show up at a county facility and see a quinceanera, a wedding, a birthday party, you know, any, every, you never know what you're going to get, and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we want to make sure we keep that, and people have come to rely on it, mm -hmm. you know, as an access point, you know, so. Um, all right, so without objection, <clears throat> I think the fiscal plan will approve that. Okay, and as far as updates, there's a few updates in your packet. The, the, there was an OLO report that was done in 2002. It made certain recommendations, and the, actually we've talked about several of them that have been completed, hiring a communications outreach manager, um, developing a guide manual that kind of has everything related to COP in one place that's easier to find for the users and that can be found online and it's linked in the packet as well as the fee study which is under which is going to be underway soon so those are those are things that cup has been able to move forward with uh, at the recommendation of OLO um, and the final one is the child care in schools uh, process that selection process for before and after school care and shared school space remains suspended, but we understand that MCPS is developing a new procurement process through its procurement and facilities office, and the intent is to hold a pilot procurement for four elementary schools that do not have school-aged child care providers there, and they're this, listed this in fall, the that would Those would open this fall? That's the plan. Is that the plan? I believe so. It is. That's what we've been okay. talking about. I hear Dr. <laughs> McKnight saying yes. Okay. Great. Obviously, <clears throat> such an important part of our, uh, you know, early care and education programming. So eager to see that move forward. So glad to hear that. Um, any other questions? Okay. Councilman Rauda. Uh, just on a fun note, I'm attending Miss Gong's 75th birthday party on Saturday <laughs> night at the Civic Building. Um, which is like full circle for her in many ways, but um, I, I, we all miss her, uh, but you're doing a fantastic job, Ms. Felkerson. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. um, anything else, Ms. Yeah? Yep, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you all for your work, and we look forward to getting an update on things uh, after the budget. You. All right, take thank care. You. Okay, so we will transition now to our uh, second um, session on the operating budget for MCPS and so welcome Dr. McKnight and we have I think we have half the school board here which is awesome uh, uh, and President Silvestri and others who are here for the, for these items and while we're waiting I want to acknowledge uh, all the board members are here. I see board member Brenda Wolf, Vice President Chevra Evans, board member Grace Rivera Oven, and I think I see board member Lynn Harris here as well. So I think we have a quorum of the of the board. <laughs> no action being taken. No action being taken. Um, and good to see everybody. Well, thank you, um, Dr. McKnight and President Silvestri. Uh, I know you have a presentation, so we want to, which is lengthy. The way we will proceed today is this is our, you know, our second session, uh, and I'll turn it over to staff, uh, Ms. McGuire, in a moment. But um, we're going to deep dive into some of the, uh, the, you know, as I framed this, is like where have we been, where are we going, and what are we changing, you know? And this is uh, we're going to talk about the accelerators. We're going to talk about math and literacy and where our students are and and why they're there and how they're going to get to the next place where we want them to be. Um, and so uh, I, I appreciate MCPS has put together a presentation. Uh, and so we'll get into that momentarily. Uh, and we will stop at key moments to ask questions so that we can dive deeper. 
and I know you'll contextualize the slides that were in the packet as well. So um, I'll start with uh, President Silvestri, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. McKnight, and then we'll get into the packet. Unless, Ms. McGuire, let me ask you, is there anything you want to frame before I do that? <clears throat> Thank you. I just say briefly, as you said, this meeting really, there, there obviously has been significant attention and a request to deep dive, as you said, into this issue of the math and literacy focus. The packet really just um, worked to pull together some of the budget elements so that obviously the school system will certainly talk through the strategic and um, programmatic elements that support that. Some of the numbers um, that are behind that are in your packet for your reference. Um, and then again, that's, that's the bulk of the first section. And then there are some other uh, follow-up sections to the packet related to other accelerators following that. Sounds good. So we'll uh, start with President Silvestri. Good morning, Chair Jawanda, Council Member Albernos, and Council Member Mink. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm here to express our full support for the MCPS FY24 operating budget. I want to make sure that you know that this budget reflects the board's priorities, uh, in particular math and literacy and fully funding our schools. We worked with the administration over a series of months, four work sessions, to really ensure that what we were hearing from the community, what we were seeing from our data was reflected in this budget. For example, uh, the data earlier this year showed that our students were not meeting expectations in terms of mathematics. And so the board asked the superintendent to ensure that we had math coaches to support our schools in improving our math scores um, uh, in this budget. We started the school year with a staffing shortage and we heard from staff and community about how excruciatingly difficult it was to operate schools when we don't have enough staff to run the school system. We are a people institution. Without good people, we cannot do fulfill our mission. So we uh, supported the superintendent's decision to offer uh, competitive compensation for our staff, as well as accelerators that help beef up our HR department so that we can have an efficient uh, organization that can bring in the talent that we need uh, in a timely manner. As I've shared with some of you, uh, DC Public Schools is now offering $64,000 a year to new teachers plus a 10,000 bonus. That's 74,000 to our 54,000. This is a reality that we're, we live in and we have to keep up in order to uh, fully staff our schools. Another example, the board uh, conducted an independent audit of our ESOL program. This data was presented to the board this year, and it showed that we are not staffing ESOL as we should, as is the standard across the country. Therefore, the board asked the superintendent to add 40 ESOL positions to the budget. You will see that in the accelerator list just to keep up with enrollment of our ESOL population uh, in this county. My point is um, this budget reflects the board's priorities. Um, and th these are things that we're seeing in the community from our staff and from our families that we desperately need. My second point, which I said last week, was these are not nice to haves, right? These are really important uh, essential elements to our school system. And I also hope that you have seen that we are using data and even external evaluations to guide our decisions as a Board of Education. We are continued to be committed to accountability as a board. And th this week you received a memo that outlines the many ways in which the Board of Education is holding the system accountable, including program evaluation, the development of a program budget, and progress monitoring, just to name a few. In collaboration with the administration, we are committed to being responsible stewards of taxpayer funds and allocating resources where they are most needed. In conclusion, I urge your full support for our operating budget, and I thank you for your continued support for our schools and our families. Thank you, President thank Silvestri. You. Thank you for those comments and in that context. Uh, Dr. McKnight. All right, good morning, Councilmember Jawando, Councilmember Avalos, Councilmember Mink. It is good to be back with you again for the second week, um, engaging in discussion about our school system's budget and most importantly, how this budget is one that we believe will accelerate our students to the next level in Montgomery County Public Schools. 
So, you know, it's interesting, last week we were just here and having conversations around uh, showcasing some of the work that we're doing in Montgomery County Public Schools. And, you know, we saw some things that were really important that speaks to some developments that we've seen since our students have been back in person and some positive news around that. But we also still have a long way to go. And we have a long way to go because we're making up ground from the pandemic. And then we're also trying to reconcile some things that have long been existing in the data that we've seen about student learning. And I, that's when I'm really referring to disparities that exist for different groups of students. And I believe that, you know, every student that comes into Montgomery County Public Schools have the responsibility um, and uh, are happy to be here. And we make that promise and that commitment that no matter your race, gender, ethnicity, culture, language, we're committed to providing you with a quality education. And so that means we have to do several things. We have to focus on knowing who our students are, supporting them in all the ways that we need to, and investing in our staff. Now last week we came before you and we gave you the visual of the three-legged stool, hoping that would be one that would remain with you as sitting on that stool was a student. And as our board president just shared, a big part of that is the investment that we have to make in staff. We want them to come live, work here, enjoy living in Montgomery County, the place in which they are providing a quality education to our students. But we also know that a critical part of that stool are the accelerators, and I want to make the connection between the two. So it is wonderful when we are able to pay and, and respect the profession of education in the way that we're supposed to. As a matter of fact, I would say that this is an opportunity for us to catch up on ground and not just how we pay our educators, but how we acknowledge the work that they do and the importance of what they do. Because as I've said before, and I'll say again, without educators, we wouldn't have council members. <laughs> we would not have uh, attorneys. We wouldn't have doctors. We would not have teachers. We would not have any profession that we depend on in this society. We would not have plumbers. Um, we would not have HVAC specialists. We need everyone in our system to be educated. And in order to do that, to actually address the gaps that I'm talking about, we have to not only invest financially in our teachers and our staff to make sure that they are paid and respected, but we also have to invest in their professional learning. What we know about any workforce is that people look to do their best and to be successful in the work that they do. So what I'd like for us to have in Montgomery County, and I know our Board of Education wants the same, is for us to have, yes, our respected pay for our educators and all in the field of education that support our students, but we also want them to feel successful in what they are doing. And that means we have to invest in their professional learning. We have to invest in their development. We have to invest in their training. And I know you all understand exactly what I'm talking about because if I went around the room and asked everybody, well, how did you learn mathematics? How did you learn reading? How did you learn another language? Our stories would be very different from what's required of how we are teaching our students today. We did not grow up, well, some of us, I won't speak for all of us, with iPads <laughs> and technology and a number of other things that make our students uh, learning right, uh, right readily available at their fingertips. And so that means that yes, we're using those conduits as ways to accelerate learning, but we also have to take into consideration how many of um, our staff in the profession may not have been taught in different ways to address the, the, the environment that we're in right now in which our students learn. Um, and so we have to make sure we're keeping up with that. And as I think about that, that's why our, our accelerators are important. Um, again, we need to make sure we're respecting and address the needs of our staff but we also have to set them up for success for what we want to see in our students. And that means that today when we have a conversation about those accelerators, our goal is to paint a picture for you in exactly how those accelerators are meeting the needs of our school system today. And we're gonna look at that through the lens of much data analysis. Um, I'd also, before we get into the, our slides about data analysis, I just wanna point out to us uh, that as Ms. Silvestri mentioned, we went through a number of work sessions when we came to a budget that the board uh, sent forward for final approval. And the Board of Education said to us very specifically, we want to address the needs in mathematics and literacy. 
we're anticipating that there's going to be a heavy hit on our students learning as a result of the pandemic. They were right. We all anticipated that and we all expected that. So now we have to be very strategic in what the things are that we are learning and have seen over time actually work for the benefit of students in Montgomery County and take those lessons and those things that we've found to be successful to the next level to help us close those gaps. And so as we continue to look at data and really think about how the data is going to allow us the opportunity to differentiate for our teachers and differentiate for our students, know that the goal is to be able to have every student in Montgomery County Public Schools be successful. And so that means the goal is as we continue to look at our graphs today and as you, the graphs you've seen about students and their learning for the last years in Montgomery County and quite frankly, nationally, we want to see those graphs become uh, closer to one another and not have these big gaps that we see separating students by service groups. And so that's gonna be a big part of what we look at today. Now, I'm, would you pull up the next slide, please? I think it's really important for us always to think about why we're doing what we're doing. And in the system, we've made a commitment to make sure we're very clear on our theory of action. And our theory of action is actually what guides our work and how we do our work. And I just wanted to share this with you because I pointed this out last week in my comments, but I wanted you to see the visual. And this is what we believe. So we believe in Montgomery County if we do three things. The first is if we're able to differentiate resources and support. That means do not treat the school system like a one size fits all because it's not. We believe if we do that, along with building staff capacity through an anti-racist lens. So that's getting at the heart of what every student needs in Montgomery County Public Schools. And if we continue to use consistent systems of accountability, if we do those three things, which is exactly what we're committed to, then we then expect to see the following outcomes, that we do have clarified expectations for what our students and adults know and are able to do. We also believe if we make those investments and focus on those areas, we're gonna increase adult expertise. Everyone's going to be so much better at their skill and their craft. And then third, this is what we also know, that when we focus on those three things and how we go about doing our work, then we're gonna have improved learning outcomes for students. And that is the goal of our institution. Dr. McKnight, if you, Council yes. Member has a question on this slide. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I just, just a quick comment. I just wanna, I know that these aren't um, in, you know, priority order, um, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to note the importance of building staff capacity because everything else, if we don't do that, and I know that that's what you're addressing through contract negotiations now, um, uh, because, if we don't do that, none of the other pieces are going to work. No, you know, we can't run programs that um, that we know should work if we don't have the people uh, who are there to be able to carry it out. Um, so just wanted to note how, how critically important that is, that that has to be our starting point, that we have to make sure, stop number one, fully staffed, buildings and that's not just teachers right that's also counselors um, that's our support staff that's esaw as you as you as you mentioned that's special ed um, all of those pieces have have to come first because we don't have all of those folks who have uh, you know, proper capacity to be able to dedicate enough time and energy to planning um, to each individual student, you know, appropriate caseloads, all of those, then, you know, all of the best programs and ideas and accelerators in the world um, are not are not going to do what, what we need them to do. So just so, you know, and I, and I say this for the public also, that as we wait for those, those contracts to come back and we talk about um, what we need to do to make sure that we're retaining and attracting, um, that's why, you know, and, um, and, uh, and then also wanted to note around the accountability structures, how important that is, um, obviously to make sure that we're being effective, but also to add to that and being transparent with the public about you know, what you're getting, the data that you're getting back, um, that as we have those accountability structures in place, that that's all being translated to the public so that they understand why you're discontinuing something, why you're continuing something, um, that uh, you know, I, I know that you crunch a lot of numbers and do, do a lot of that, you know, figuring out of quantitative and qualitative data behind the scenes, um, but I think moving into an era where as much of that is being brought in front of the public as is possible, I think is gonna be very much appreciated, and, um, and that's what I, what I look forward to getting to today. Thanks. Thank you. 
Absolutely, that was a perfect TF, and I thank you for elevating those pieces of the theory of action. Um, we are working with all of our associations and addressing these issues. You know, a big part of what we do is, yes, we negotiate around economics, but we also uh, negotiate around working conditions. And, and I'll give you, um, you know, as, as you, you share that, um, that process becomes very important because, and I think in the context of where we are right now, as a result of the pandemic, there were some things that were highlighted that addressed areas that we needed to focus on long before. Many of structures that existed that were probably in existence before I was here, you were here, any of us were here, that we need to look at and figure out what works best for the teaching and learning environment. And so we are focused on that. And as Dr. Murphy gives his comments uh, in just a few, then he's going to give some examples of um, exactly how we do that and make this theory of action, quite frankly, come alive in the accelerators. The next slide, please. So this is, actual, this is actually the visual of what I spoke with you about last week, and it is the pathway for student success in college, career, and community readiness. And I was just talking about the theory of action representing how, but when you think about the pathways, this really emphasizes why we do what we do. And we see the pathways, quite frankly, as the North Star for what we want to accomplish in the system. And this is work that has been developing over the past year as we have worked with our staff in what are the things that we want to look at that will define where we want our students to be and how we want them to accomplish that throughout their journey from kindergarten to high school. And so here we have it here, and I'll just point out a few components of the pathway. The first are the academic milestones, and you'll see that that's to the right of the visual in all the uh, shades of blue. Um, that you see, and those are the academic milestones which are set to really talk about what the academic um, indicators are that we want students to meet throughout K-12. And the second are the competencies, and the competencies are really the cognitive, social, and emotional skills and dispositions that we actually want our students to develop over time. And when you look at the bottom of this graphic, that's where you're going to see the competencies. And we're so proud of that because we want to share with our students and with our staff and with our community that what we want to accomplish are students who meet the academic milestones, but the students who also have these power skills that we know are going to be really important for them as they go into college, career, into different community service aspects. And then we focus on the experiences, and those are the experiences that our students are going to participate in in trying to acquire the different competencies that you see, or have, see here at the bottom of the graph. I'll tell you, last night I had an opportunity to be a part of a panel at the University of Maryland College Park, and they have these Terrapin Ed Talks. And it was so nice. I was great to be there. I saw some of our teachers who came up and talked with me afterwards, some of our parents, um, and they were there just listening to the scholars talk about all of the different things that they've learned through research that really informs directions that we should go into in revitalizing public education. And I was just honored to be there and to hear those presentations. When I was on the panel, they asked me a question and they said, um, what have you heard tonight that gives you an aha moment that will be something that you take back with you as a superintendent? And I remember thinking immediately, everything that I heard in the presentations tonight and through watching the presentations, I'm thinking about our pathways to college, career, and community readiness. And yes, for every speaker and presenter that gave an ed talk last evening, yes, I'm sure they probably all met their academic milestones when they were in school. But here's what I also saw. I saw them presenting those other skills that we know are important for our students to have, like leadership, equity inclusion, good presentation skills, orally and written, Digital citizenship, these were things that I saw them enter, that I saw every speaker interacting with as they were giving presentations that I must say were captivating to the audience. And so when we think about a well-rounded student, I'm thinking about our business community who sat with us and said, when we hire students from Montgomery County Public Schools, here are the skills we're looking to see. And so we just don't want to put that responsibility onto those organizations when those students leave MCPS, right? We want to work with them and have invited them in to helping us actualize these competencies 
through providing our students experiences with their organizations and businesses right here in Montgomery County Public Schools. And here's what I know. They're not just going to have the opportunity to emphasize those competencies, but they're also building relationship. So those who are looking to go right into career after high school, they already have relationships and they're building social capital, which is going to be also important for them. So I share that with you because I, I, I want to continue to show the picture of how everything that we do in the K-12 space should contribute to all of the experiences we want students to have after graduation, while they're here, but then also after graduation, because we know that in turn benefits our community. When I was here last, and I'm going to close with this, I, I referred to um, this budget and our school system as the economic engine of the community. It won't run. It will not run with, a car will not run without an engine. The school system has to be a center part of that. And I just wanted to leave you with a few examples in terms of how I outline this economic engine as we go into the conversation to keep at the top of mind. So I, as I think about the engine that we, we conduct and crank up every day, I'm thinking about how it develops the workforce development. So successful schools produce graduates who are prepared to be lifelong learners, right? And they're prepared for the workforce. So we're actually doing workforce development in the school system. Second, we contribute to economic growth. A well-performing school system is going to attract new businesses, new industries within its community. That's our charge and we understand that. It also promotes entrepreneurship and innovation in so many different ways that I think contribute to a thriving business community. It also adds to increased property values. Quality schools are often a significant factor in families making the decision to rent, to buy, and there is a benefit to local real estate. As a part of that engine, we also understand the importance of community engagement. And successful schools do cultivate and engage active citizens, no matter who they are in the community, to be a part of the educational infrastructure. That's who we are and what we're committed to with this budget and beyond. And as we continue to go through talking about these accelerators and how they contribute to this engine that we have operating as MCPS in Montgomery County Public Schools, know that it is all about the reinvestment in our students and the improved outcomes we want them to experience during K-12 and post-K-12. And so I thank you for that. I will now turn it over to Dr. Murphy um, so that he can get into the particulars of those accelerators. And I look forward to us engaging in discussion um, about them throughout the data slides. Appreciate that. And Dr. Murphy, it is 9.59 and a half. So we're going to, uh, will, we will pause you as we want to ask questions about the various data. And I know you have your team here. And just if you speak for the first time, just please introduce yourself and what you do at MCPS. And, start with you you can model that behavior all right thank you first of all i want to thank the uh, education and culture committee members for being here and uh, taking the time this morning we have some information that we think is very important that we want to share with you and also share with you sort of our thinking about how we got here and i want to echo some of the comments of dr mcknight and uh chair silvestri is we came forward with a budget initially the the board asked us to go back and uh, look at some more information, and then they adopted this budget unanimously uh, to propose it to the county executive. So uh, there has been a lot of thinking. There has been a lot of decision making that's gotten us to this point. I'm going to go through a high level of the information I'm going to share with you this morning. So it'll kind of reinforce. I know there's a lot of charts. I know there's a lot of data. I know you're seeing this for the first time, and I do want to make note um, the packet that you received last night, there have been some slight changes, so the slides may not match up 100%. So I'll try and make note of that as, as we go through that. Some of the first information we're going to share with you is on academic performance, and it's going to look through two lenses. The first lens is a summative lens over a four-year period of time, four- to five-year period of time. The second lens, and we'll stop there, uh, Councilman Juwando, so if there are questions, uh, we'll have a natural stop there. The second set of information that we're going to look at 
is data around our evidence of learning. And that uh, includes multiple sources of data that talks about academic achievement. We look at grades, we look at formative tests, and we look at summative information. We'll stop there as well. And what I'm trying to do is paint a picture for you as far as how we got to the decisions that we made about the accelerators and why we think those are the key levers to make to, uh, to bring about improvement. And what you're going to see in the data is what Dr. McKnight has already mentioned. You are going to see that we are making progress in some areas, that stu some students are achieving at a high level. But there are also disparities and there are gaps. And that's where the accelerators are driven, or that's what those accelerators are doing, is addressing those gaps along the theory of uh, you know, action. I know the council and I know our board has been very anxious about accountability and we're going to speak to that directly this morning. We are creating a culture of accountability in the school district around upgrades to our formal evaluation process, around implementing a new program monitoring system. And you saw just another element here uh, just a minute ago with the pathway. That is an accountability piece as well. So we recognize that how we leverage the resources that are provided, we're responsible for that as fiscal stewards of public funds, and we take that responsibility very seriously, as does the superintendent and the board. So let's go to the next slide, please. I'll just reinforce what we said uh, earlier. Um, you know, Dr. McKnight touched on this, but we are looking at the fact that we are increasing enrollment and we also have inflation. We're talking specifically to supporting staff that is a, our life's blood that makes our organization run. And then we're going to dig in a little bit deeper this morning on the, what the accelerators are specifically focused on math and literacy instruction and why those are so important. Without, with one piece of these uh, legs of the stool missing, then we create inconsistencies and we just exacerbate the gaps that we uh, presently have in place. Next slide, please. I've really given you an overview of this. Uh, this is just an outline of the presentation, but it reinforces what I said earlier. We're going to talk a little bit about background information and data. We're going to address baseline, which is uh, around our core services or uh, core instruction that happens in our classroom, and I know the council was interested in that. And then I'm going to link that information, or I'm going to thread that through the theory of action and thread that through based on what the data is telling us and the time we spent to come up with those accelerators and why they are so important. Next slide, please. So an overview, which I've already touched on, is we are seeing progress um, in the district, but that's at the aggregate level. When you disaggregate the information, we are seeing uh, success unevenly. And we still see disparities across our service groups of students who are either receiving language, special education, and meal services, and also among African American and Hispanic and Latino students. Let's give a backdrop to that. Next slide, please. As far as what is happening with student enrollment. And so if you look at the, the chart here, and the charts are going to lay out very similarly, so I'll just kind of uh, give you a thumbnail. Um, the, uh, the blue bars to the left are going to be the totals. And then what you'll see either by service group or by uh, race and ethnicity are the stack bars. Um, and so these charts pretty consistently outline themselves in this way. What I want to note today, as of April 15th, our student enrollment is 162,601 students. The projection for next fall is 162,400 students. So already today, and while I recognize there's ebbs and flows, we've got kids graduating, we've got a new K class coming in, people moving in out of the district. But I think it's an important message here to recognize we're already above where we are today, above that projection. So I want to note that. Um, and, and that'll shift a little bit, but I think there's a good story in there. And that story is that we're seeing students after the pandemic and families having their children return to public education. So um, I just wanted to make yeah. note of that. Just, we... I just want to point out on this slide, which stuck one of the many things that stuck out to me, obviously, that you had the dip that you saw, everyone saw during the pandemic. 
but as the enrollment has come back up, the enrollment, uh, the, the demographics have continued to change. Uh, you know, in 2020, our, our white student population was 44,436. In 2023, it's 39,157, right. almost a 5,000 right. Our Latino population jumped up 2,500 students in that time period. And I think that's an important part of the story. Um, as, as we'll talk about in later slides, free and reduced lunch, we have over 43% of our students in poverty, as I know you'll talk about. The Ever Farms rate is, is over 50%, I'm sure. So the changing nature of who we're serving, mm -hmm. and I want to be very clear, every student can learn. I was a poor black student, and I learned, and I did okay, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and but it's it's about the needs and what they need to learn um, is is a big part of this picture and I just wanted to point that out for our public. No, and thank you for that. We had that conversation yesterday, and I think that illustrates also why we see uh, how strategic these accelerators are and why they're so important for every child. So let's go to the next slide. So again, um, we're going to be looking through the lens of our summative data. This, this first set of information is summative, um, and it'll either capture four or five years. It's noted here there are some years where we have gaps, where there were not assessments administrated because of the pandemic. But you can see here um, that uh, at the aggregate, um, we're plateauing, or we're having pretty consistent performance as we come out of the pandemic. But if you look a little bit deeper into that, um, specifically, uh, at the Hispanic and Latino students um, there in the yellow, uh, and then our black and African American students, uh, they are not make, they're not, not performing at the same level, and there are gaps or disparities that we need to be able to address. I'm also going to just note that while some of our students are meeting benchmark or meeting standard, uh, the progress is going to look different for students that are performing below that. We're not going to see a spike and a change overnight. We're going to have to build in investments for that progress to grow three to five percent. And so that's the, the motivation and that's the intent of where, where we're headed. Yeah, just before you move, just, just so we're clear, I want to, you know, some people may look at this and their eyes glaze over. In 2019, our Latino students, 50 percent of them were in third graders were achieving uh, at the level we would expect, right? Am I reading that right? As, or so, it's maybe a little higher than that. I'm just reading the yellow bars. I just want yep. you to explain what this means so that people understand. So if you look at the yellow bars which is for, for on 2019, it looks like it's just over 50% were on level for grade right. three reading, right? right? Is that correct? And That's then that correct. dropped, we didn't have that in 2020, it dropped below, mm -hmm. closer to 40% in 2021. It's inched up a little bit, but still below pre-pandemic levels. Correct, and the other thing important to note about this data are that um, these are different cohorts of students, so right. it's not the same third graders year to year. So right. this is looking at a program analysis. How are the programs designed to serve these students, and how are the students achieving as a result of the programs right. at third grade, for instance? And obviously that's much different from the 66% when you aggregate all third grade students in those very different cohorts. Exactly. You're masking, yeah. you're masking, uh, you're getting an average. You've got the highs and the lows, and so then that average may be masking where the real issues are. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to put that. No, I appreciate that. Appreciate you stopping us. All right, next slide, please. So we're going to move on now to talk about grade nine on track graduation. And this slide is looking at race and ethnicity. And so this is showing the percentage of students in ninth grade who are on track to graduate. And that's measured by the number of credits they've earned at this point in their high school career. Um, and it's a good indicator to say, are they on track, are they not, what adjustments we, do we need to make with the remaining three years that they have um, in, in school. And so again, you can see at the aggregate that's represented by the, the darker blue bar that um, you know we're at a 81 to 84, so we're moving in a positive direction. But when you dig into the information a little bit more, you can see continued concerns about where our Hispanic students are, even though we did make a jump from 67 to 72, uh, we're not meeting some of the same standards that we see that are with the other groups, as well as, um, you know, we, there is a nice increase there for our black students going from almost 80 to 84 percent. But again, what I'm trying to convey to you this morning and in my main message is 
looking at these disparities and how are we going to be able to address those so that all students are achieving as their peers are. We good? All right, let's go to the next slide. Look at the, looking at the same category of information, however, we've broken this down by service groups. Service groups, again, are those students receiving free meals, maybe receiving language services or special education services. Again, we can see, and this plays out pretty consistently with the data that I'm going to show you, uh, students who are receiving free meals are showing some real nice progress, uh, and that'll play out with the next several uh, sections of slides that I share with you. Uh, again, concerns about our second language students as they are coming into our county or maybe in the process of learning the English language. Uh, we'd like to see them performing better, so how do we reinforce some of those skills and abilities? And then with our special education students here, we do see uh, an increase from the last two years, uh, but again, not at the same level that we would expect for all students. All right, next slide, please. So one thing that we also know and we see that's uh, important is that we give students rigorous experiences. Um, and one way to do that is through advanced placement or international baccalaureate. It's also through dual enrollment. It's also through CTE. And I'm going to talk to all of those uh, a little bit this morning. Um, so we are looking through the lens of those students who are having access to the exam. And then we're going to look at students who, uh, what their performance is. A uh, three or higher typically earns uh, college credit, and so that's a benefit to families if their children pursue a, a post-secondary uh, education. Coming out of the pandemic, we do see that there was uh, a decline in participation, uh, and that is not uh, unusual. We've seen that sort of nationally across the board, but we want to get back to pre-pandemic rates and also increase that. So this aligns directly with not only the MCPS pathway, but the Maryland blueprint, and we want to make sure that all of our students' groups are continuing to participate in high-level courses. And more importantly, they're taking the rigorous assessments. So there's two parts here. There's participation, and there's also performance. We see often that students refrain from taking the exam because the cost becomes a barrier, uh, and we want to make sure that in the accelerators that we have, that that cost does not become the barrier for them to take advantage of that experience. We also want to continue to increase the number of students who are taking those important exams, and I've uh, highlighted them, but I'll reinforce them. First, it prepares them for a post-secondary opportunity. And second, as I mentioned, it provides them the opportunity to earn college credits while still in high school and actually save their families' uh, tuition costs or save themselves tuition costs. It's also a strong collaboration with Montgomery College and the universities of Shady Grove, um, many of our higher education institutes. So as Dr. McKnight said, all of this is kind of part of the economic picture and how these relationships tie closely together. Next slide, please. So again, we're looking at um, access to exams uh, through uh, similar lens of service groups. Again, you see the farm students uh, increasing there pretty significantly. However, we see flat scores among the other two groups with our uh, second language students or our students receiving language services and students who receive special education services. So we need to see progress there. We need to see the same progress across the board uh, and the accelerators that we are addressing um, are part of that, but also, as noted earlier, so is the anti-racism audit looking at our actions, looking at what decisions we are making, how are we creating equitable opportunities for all students to take those rigorous exams and also um, avail themselves to the, the benefits of those experiences. Because we're still below pre-pandemic levels yeah. as well, even for farm students, so yeah. we've got work to do there. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But we're headed in the right direction, so right direction. We, we, need to, yeah. we need to look at things that are working and you know, continue to reinforce them. All right, next slide, please. Did you want to say something? You look like you're ready to jump in there. Um, uh, all right, we're shifting here to AP exam performance. So now we want to make sure that students are taking the exams, but how are they performing? And uh, when we look at this information, uh, you can see uh, 
the, the slides are arrayed in much the similar matter with the, uh, the darker blue bar in the aggregate, and we did make some progress there. However, when we uh, dig a little bit deeper into it uh, and looking at black students, uh, and I'm just looking at 2021 to 2022 as a for instance, uh, we've gone from uh, uh, 42 to 47, so a little bit of progress moving in the right direction. And that's probably about what we'll see for uh, annual increases. So we'd like to see that 47 go to 52 or even higher uh, next year. So we'll monitor that very closely. Uh, and again, uh, looking at, uh, we saw a decline, however, with our Hispanic and uh, Latino students, a uh, decline of, oh, no, uh, sorry, as an increase of 6%. So again, we're seeing some nice progress there from 21 to 22. Um, there are continued to be disparities, though, as, as the theme of the data continues to play out. And so what we ultimately want is, first, we want to make sure that all students have access to these opportunities. That's what the blueprint provides. That's what the uh, pathway is reinforcing. We also want to make sure they're taking the test, that they're prepared, they're ready to take the test. We want to make sure they're performing well. And most importantly, we want to make sure that they earn a score of three or higher. So ha what do we need to make that happen? That's what the accelerators are addressing and reinforcing. We'll move to the same information broken down by service group. Again, we're seeing some nice progress here. Uh, moving from uh, 41 to 47 among our um, uh, farms groups of students, uh, or excuse me, yes, farms groups of students. Uh, but we want to make sure that we have the, uh, we're in position to make sure these increments uh, continue to grow. The other information is a little bit flat. Um, I do want to make note, and it's important to look at, what is the total end size? We did see a little bit of a dip so that total end size from 2019 to 2020 also has somewhat of an uh, effect on how the data plays itself out. Councilmember Mink has a question here. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I was curious about um, AP exams taken broken down into these into these groups um, because you know if we have you know an accelerator attached to this, then we want to see you know are we is a result of that. Students of uh, more means are just taking more of them, or are we actually increasing access to you know our our farms and and other students? Uh, do we have this? Do you have that particular data? Good morning. I'm Peggy Pugh, Chief Academic Officer from Montgomery County Public Schools, and the direct accelerator to this would be the Academic Opportunity Specialists. And they are actually linked to the schools where we have um, concerted efforts happening to talk to students about what courses they're taking um, and why they're not maybe taking more rigorous courses, and then strategically put, um, encouraging them to take courses that are in their areas of strength. And so what we've seen there is at the high school level, more students um, of color and more students uh, who, who may not have considered themselves as an AP student uh, taking that step in a supported way to participate in the courses. And then for teachers to actually be working with those students while they're in the course. So our thought is, why wait until ninth grade to work with those students to, to acknowledge what their strengths are and what their areas of interests are? Why not give them experiences in middle school where they have a coach and someone mentoring them to get into a higher level course? Um, so that's the direct accelerator. And then the covering the fees for everybody, is that required in the blueprint, covering them for everybody? Yes. Or is that, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. And as we've talked about them knowing that they ha can have it, that's something I've heard from students consistently, just not knowing that they are covered and that's, the communication is always an issue, but we just need to keep keep that up to get that overall in size up. Oh, right, know, right, and then taken. and then tracking like each of these data points um, is going to be most useful to us, I think, and to the public um, in the context of the budget to see these data points attached to specific accelerators like that. So, like, what I'm curious about is, you know, as we look at these successes, what are we attributing them to and why? And, you know, and that helps us to explain why you are spending budget on that. When we look at them in generalities to say, here is our successes, 
um, overall, and here's where we're falling short overall. Um, you know, not knowing what to what you're, they're being attributed to makes it hard to to make like a budgetary uh, recommendation or or understanding attached to that. I can say in the next uh, part of the presentation where we talk about the accelerators, Dr. Murphy will give some specific examples in terms of why we're replicating some specific practices in which we've seen success that speaks to why we're looking to expand those accelerators within the budget. Um, and then some of it we will try. Some of it we will try based on some of the qualitative data that we've been able to collect as well, like mm -hmm. for instance. Um, we are seeing data nationally and no different here in Montgomery County in terms of there needing to be a more focused uh, effort in our middle school students. And, you know, we've looked at data for years that really speaks to how the engagement has to look differently and the engagement has to be a different experience for them in middle school. And so we do a lot of introducing students to AP and different uh, tracks of uh, interest when they get to high school. The fact of the matter is we've recognized and have heard from our students and have seen and researched data that speaks to us needing to expose them more at the middle school level. And when we look at areas like mathematics and things like that specifically, we see that playing out and how it's played out more for middle school students during the pandemic. Thank um, you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's why I'm, I'm really eager to get to that. Like what's the line item and what is the explanation for it, I think is, is really going to be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Getting, getting closer to that. Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you. So we could be here days, weeks, uh, digging into this. Um, and the macro level is helpful. It is. Uh, it, it tells a story. You know, but I'm equally as interested school by school, zip code by zip code, geography by geography. And I know in the second phase we're going to get to what's working and, and see if we can replicate and expand. But um, just on the AP front, how are we letting families and students know what advanced placement is? Um, how are we marketing that to them and how, because there may be students who are just not as aware of that particular track and if I could get a little bit of an explanation of where that, what that looks like. Because particularly for our, our, our Latino students, those that are newly arriving, they're not familiar with our system. They're not familiar with how the structure works um, and so just be curious as to that. I'll start. Uh, it, it actually begins with uh, transition planning. When a student is in eighth grade, talking with the students and their families and giving them information about the program of studies that are available at their high schools and the choices that they have throughout the county in terms of programs. It's a lot of information that's given to families at that time. It's a lot of uh, questions that come back and forth about what the students should do. The, the teachers often give recommendations to their individual students and the students can talk to their families. But what we found is that volume of information in eighth grade to then make their determination about what course pathways they want in high school is, is, is uh, too much too late. So I, our plan is to do more thoughtful academic planning in sixth and seventh grade so that students are aware of what opportunities that they have and really what how what they're doing in middle school is connected to where they might want to go um, in their future. And that is how you build in some of those intentional experiences that Dr. McKnight spoke about. Because if you don't know there is a chance for you to go directly to Montgomery County and then to USG and a complete a four-year program in an area of interest, then your middle school courses might not be as relevant to you at that point. At that point, they're just doing school out of compliance. We're hoping to re-engage and ignite them to think about how can I uh, take a course sequence and a, and a pathway, try things that I feel that I'm good at and successful at, and um, go through K-12 and have access to higher ed. And I'll just add on a few things. When I talked about the economic engine, I mentioned community engagement because we know as we're backing the train up per se and exposing our students earlier to these opportunities so that they can take advantage of them in high school. We also real, realize that the conversation has to go beyond the student, but also with the families. So we've been working with community groups, uh, identifying credible messengers within the community to help us set up forms to be able to do that. Like for instance, the first show we're gonna have on the road is the uh, Pathways to College, Career, and Community Readiness. We're here presenting this to you today, but we also want our families and our community members to understand why this is important. And, and if we're gonna use it as an outward accountability tool, we want them to understand what that is. So that's, that's uh, one way, engaging, using credible messages within the community to help us with that engagement so that we are connecting with community members. 
And second, if you remember uh, last year when I um, created my um, uh, my uh, executive leadership team, <laughs> one of the positions that I had in there was the community liaison, um, which is Ms. Elba Garcia, which I think is in the audience today. And so her charge is to work closely with our communications team to actually go out and identify those specific groups within our community so that they understand what it is that um, the system is doing, how it then exposes the opportunity for more access for students. So those who we're trying to increase engagement in these different programs, it actually happens because we're working not only with the students but also with the families and targeting specific areas within our community um, of our families who we know we need to do more of that outreach with. And, and um, so those are the ways that we continue to double down on that because it is important. It has to be a family discussion. And, and I'm glad you asked that question, Council Member Avernos, because sometimes it is us working with the families to help them realizing, help them realize that your child is actually ready for this. And it's actually not going to be a demand on them that they can't meet. And sometimes, you know, our parents say, well, I, you know, I don't want them to get a bad grade, so I don't want them to try. And then we can then explain all the different support that we have in place as well. So that just builds confidence in not only the process, but the people that we want to be involved in helping them make that decision for the student. I appreciate that. And, and again, we'll, I'd love to do a follow up on this specifically after budget's over, um, Chair Jawander, just because it's, there's, it is overwhelming on a good day. I mean, being a parent is hard, really, really hard. Uh, and you're just getting bombarded by thousands of pieces of information on everything. Then you add to that language barriers, cultural barriers, um, and it, it just gets to be overwhelming and people get lost in the shuffle. And I concur with starting that process earlier, but it's just as overwhelming in sixth and seventh grade as it is in eighth. And a caring adult, often a teacher, um, is who has the most direct access to a student can, and is in among the better positions to unlock uh, his or hers interests and abilities. Watch the movie Stand and Deliver a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and so I think there's, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear more, not right now because there's too much to get through, but how exactly we're doing this. Because um, there are extremely talented students that are out there. Um, but we're just not getting to them. Um, and so I think that's important. And I, I can speak about that in the first person being in the youth development space for a long time. So thanks. And one, one moment, please, uh, Council Member Jawando. I just want to say I know that we're sharing a lot of data slides today, but in the spirit of transparency, it's really important. We, in our board meetings every other week, you know, we, we hear from our public and we hear them asking for the transparency. And we also see or hear often people um, sharing information that reflects data that they believe is actually what's, you know, what's happening in Montgomery County Public Schools. Well, in a spirit to be transparent, we want to share with you and with the public all the data that we have available to share where our students are in Montgomery County. And I think that's really important when we talk about the budget because as I hear comments, you know, or people say, you know, the school system um, is not where it used to be, or the school system has a lot of ground to make up. These things have changed. All we can do is look at the numbers, and the numbers tell the story of the faces that we see every single day. And so I know we have a number of data slides, but I also think that we owe this to all of our hardworking employees who do the work that actually adds to the increases in things that you see here to elevate what they're doing and what we're learning from the things that they do in their classrooms and in the buildings that actually work for students so that we can then know what it is that we need to replicate. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And it's answer, it's responsive to the question I said, where are we? So we want to know that. We just want, then we will get to what's working and what's not and what do we, where do we need to do to change that? And so we're going to have that conversation and it'll be a continuing uh, conversation. Uh, I agree with Councilman Ravanaz around uh, the need to come back to this. Um, you know, we should make sure that uh, all of our students, as they ladder up, are being prepared and socialized and assessed for this type, these type of rigorous, uh, you know, tests. Um, and also, and also, just realize that the value too, like, you know, the value proposition of do you need to take five of them or four? You know, like, we're, you know, that's a, a question too. Like, that takes some navigation. Like, you don't know that. Like, you might think I need to take all the AP, and that's not really probably what you would do. I, you know, you, you know, so. Um, there's a lot there. Um, I'm going to do my own data question. Are you cold? 
Who's cold? If you're cold, raise your hand. Okay. All right. All right. You feel good? Okay. All right. It's about mixed, so I'm going to not do anything about it. Uh, but I wanted to ask. So if you're cold, put a sweater on. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, yeah, do some push-ups, right? And and all right. And I want to thank Jennifer Martin from MCEA and Byron Johns from the Black and Brown Coalition for being here as as critical partners. All right. Let's let's keep let's keep diving in, Dr. Murphy. All right. Thank you. Just so you know, on a personal level, I'm hot. <laughs> well, I, you all tend to be hot because you have the lights right on you. So, <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. And I just want to uh, edit, editorialize for just a second. Um, I think this conversation is part of that awareness in making folks aware and knowledgeable because it gives us then the opportunity to have those conversations out in the community uh, and having uh, somewhat of a similar experience this is the path to make that happen. Increasing family awareness so they have time to make decisions and they do know becomes an important element in the whole conversation. So starting early works. So we're gonna shift now to um, CTE concentrators and um, the term CTE concentrator, just to define that for you, is a student who earned two or more credits in a single program of study. So uh, likely a focus in they may be exploring something as a, a potential career path or a career experience. They can earn more than two credits, and for instance, nursing is one, or automotive is another. We have a whole plethora of different areas, but I wanted to kind of use those uh, as exemplars. The news here is good, but we think we can do better. The all you know, uh, rising tide raises all ships. You can see the numbers just increasing from 2019 to 2020. However, it's part of the Maryland bl blueprint that more students uh, have this experience as well as the pathway, which is an accountability document for us to make sure that students are moving along, along that path. So we want to encourage that participation. When we shift now to, uh, next slide please, uh, service groups. Again, we're kind of seeing the same pattern, unfortunately, with our students receiving language services and special education services. We are seeing some trends that we really make, need to make sure that we are addressing. Um, we did exceed pre-pandemic rates for our farm students, but we think there is a whole bunch more potential here that we can take advantage. The budget is designed to fund these areas and supporting programs such as Edison and Seneca Valley High School all really part of differentiating resources based on the needs of students. I do want to make note that this is aligned with the Maryland Blueprint, which has a goal of 45% or more of the students graduating earning a CTE credential. And the message in there also is not all students need to go to four-year college. There are other pathways that they can take to be successful. All right, I'm going to move now uh, to dual enrollment access. The numbers play out here a little bit similar. We were on a nice um, upbeat. Um, I do want to make note that in 2021, we were seeing students take advantage of more virtual experiences. So we're attributing that, that spike there as a result of them taking you know, uh, classes virtually. Um, the, uh, the one piece is you, know, you may ask specifically, well, what is a dual enrollment? Um, it's an opportunity for students to take a high school class simultaneously aligned with a college course where they can then earn uh, credits from a higher uh, education institution such as Montgomery College or um, from USG, the universities of uh, USG. This is aligned also with having ma making sure that all students have access, so it is uh, funding them, providing the funding so that they can take advantage of that opportunity. Um, and you know, we see this as something with our relationships with Montgomery College and USG that we can build on uh, because of their strong support as well. <coughs> All right, if we then switch to the same information here uh, by service group, next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, we're going to shift then to um, immediate college enrollment after high school. And so the chart displays the number of students who are entering right after high school uh, into a, a school over the last four years. This is an option for many of our students. Um, 
We've gleaned this data from the National Clearinghouse, and what we've seen as a trend is approximately over 1,200 students uh, in the last four years, uh, and this is exceeding pre-pandemic levels, so that is encouraging. Uh, the good news is we have, the, we have seen an increase in the number of our students in the past four years taking advantage <laughs> of the college option. That's against the national trend. There actually has been a dip nationally in students after high school going into college. Conversely, though, based on the total number of graduates that we have, we see there be an opportunity for more of them to avail themselves to the option either right after high school or at some time in the future if they decide either to you know, pursue a career option uh, temporarily or you know, extend their college experience. So again, we see the benefits of post-secondary, uh, the post-secondary option, but we want to you know, leverage how we can take advantage of that. Part of the accelerators that we're going to talk about talk about how they can pursue that, and it is part of our pathway initiative. So I'm going to stop there, uh, Councilman Jawando. I think we are uh, at a discussion point. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. We've been kind of uh, intermittently stopping along the way, so. You know, I think, colleagues, I think we're fine. I think the evidence of learning and getting into the base budget, I think that's where, in the accelerators, that's at least for me, that's where most of the questions are going to be. So uh, I think, staff, do you have, and Mr. Fire, anything at this point? So I think we can move on. Yeah, we're good? Okay. Here we go. Now we'll get into the, I think you'll get more stoppage here. Okay. All right. Very good. So um, the previous information that I shared with you is summative. It's over the last four or five years. It gives you a sense of what's happening. I do want to make uh, a note. We want to establish this as a footprint. So you want us to come back in the future. This is a footprint from where we can build and then be held accountable as we move forward through uh, future meetings and discussions. So we're going to talk to you next about the evidence of uh, learning uh, information that we have here. And the evidence of learning, uh, or EOL framework, intentionally uses multiple measures to determine student performance that include classroom grades, data from curriculum line assessments, and also state and national assessments. Next. Okay, let's stay right there, please. Um, the EOL mid-year data allows MCPS to examine the success of students transitioning from one grade level to the next. So for instance, our checkpoint is how are students in kindergarten, grades three, six, and nine transitioning from pre-K, second grade, fifth grade, and eighth grade. So we want to look at that, and that's part of us checking and also making sure if any adjustments need to be made or what, what things we need to put in place. You'll note on the right-hand side of the slide, those are the data points that we uh, pull and access. Uh, and then we look at this, the board looks at this information regularly two times a year. All right, next slide, please. So we're breaking this down into um, a variety of different slides. I want to just highlight for you. The gray bars on both of the charts uh, look at the school year 2022 information. The colors of uh, either red, orange, or green are associated with the grade levels for 2023, and this is the most recent data that we have. So on the left slide, you see in the aggregate where the performance is. In third grade, uh, we made a three percentage point increase with the number of students who are meeting evidence of learning standard. You can see at sixth grade, we made a pretty significant jump, um, and we'll attribute that to uh, students uh, returning to the classroom more regularly. And then at grade nine, you can see uh, that uh, it's pretty relatively flat or consistent from year to year. When we transition over to the right side, where I want your eyes to uh, travel to is, are we exceeding the gray bars? So if you look at third grade, and this is by service groups, and we've got meals, special education, and um, language services, we can see some nice increases uh, there from uh, the previous year. The same is true when we transition to sixth grade and the gold bars are orange bars. And then when you move to ninth grade, you see a little bit of a dip um, between what the performance was in 2022 uh, to 2023. Um, I do want to make note, because I'll bring this up later, where students are achieving uh, and meeting standards and then where they are in relationship to making progress. So we see some nice progress here. We also see some plateauing, 
and we also see a little bit of a decline. Next slide, please. You'll talk about, just if you could go back and just talk about the, I know this, this is a trend, but I think it's important to, to note here that while we see progress, you know, it's some progress for third grade between last year and this year, more progress for sixth grade. Uh, we see declines for special education in students in poverty for ninth grade for math, uh, except, you know, students with uh, language access, you see a slight uptick. There's a consistent trend I think we'll see in the slides on ninth grade. you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me go a little, let me go a little bit yeah, deeper just into sure you, some just of the sure information and then that. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll come back to that. So what we've done, and again, I, I want, what we're trying to do is give a global picture here. I, I do want to make note, uh, Councilman Jawando, I, I do want to go back um, to the previous slide. Depending on where students are achieving, it's easier to make larger gains. If we're at the 90%, for instance, mark, it's harder to make those gains. If we're at a lower performance point, it's going to be easier for some of those gains to occur. And again, I want to uh, manage expectations here about the increases that we're going to see uh, year to year. But a three to five is typically those things that we want to continue to build on that. That's, in the case of the sixth graders, that's pretty, a uh, pretty significant gain that they made within that short period of time. So um, the job well done there. Yeah, and just, to, just and I'm going to turn to Councilmember Mink, but can you just describe, so the, the X and the Y here, the, you know, obviously the bottom, it's easy to tell that, that you, those are the groups of students, farm students, special education, English. Um, we change these, this EML, we change it so much, EML is, Students who are receiving language services. Yeah, but what does EML stand for again? Uh, uh, emergent. Multilingual. You guys don't even know. No, we do. <laughs> emerging multilingual learners. Yeah, right. got it. Okay, because we have changed that. We have there has been nothing in education that's changed more than that. Those terms to research to, to speak, those students. Okay, so that's the bottom. So the left hand side, the zero twenty forty sixty. Explain what that means, please. That that is the data from if you roll back to the uh, composite of multiple data sources of students that are meeting the standard of the evidence of learning. So those are so grades. So 43 percent of third grade farm students are meeting evidence of learning in math as of January 2023. Correct. Right. I just think it's really important because you can gloss through these and people don't know what they mean. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Mink. Thanks. Yeah. Um, a couple things. One, just noting that um, it would be, and maybe we have this later, but good to have it broken down. Um, how many of these students were recent arrivals, international recent arrivals, because that can obviously, those trends can have a major impact on data around our outcomes here, um, and also in thinking about, uh, you know, resources and, and so on. Um, and then also it would be helpful to have these trends tied to some of the investments you've made, changes you've made, accelerators, and so on, um, you know, recognizing that it is, uh, you know, that it takes a lot of time to make changes in a large school system, um, but it would be good to know, you know, what you have tried differently from last year or in previous years, what you've added, what you've taken away, um, that's resulted in some of the trends that we're, that we're seeing here and that informs your decisions moving forward. That's where I want to. Couldn't agree more. Um, you know, just none of this is new. Uh, and, and we've been trying now for a number of years to bring these numbers up. And while there have been some small incremental increases, which is, I guess, good news, but overall, um, th this trend has been going on for quite some time. So I would be curious as to, and Ms. McGuire, if we could come up with um, just sort of what other initiatives have been done by MCPS prior to this administration and this superintendent. And what, where are they now? We're, we're, have those continued um, the life cycle of those programs and services? We're asking for a lot of new money, um, but I'd just be curious as to how much of that are we continuing to invest in previous initiatives and programs and where they stand and how they fit into, and I'm sure we'll get into how they are connected to some of the new proposed accelerators that are being proposed. And just back to something that you said earlier, Dr. McKnight, um, I have no problem with all the graphs. These are great. Um, and so what I think in moving forward, um, better understanding 
what additional supports these families and these students are receiving outside of MCPS's control. Um, what services are they receiving from HHS? What services are they receiving from our housing assistance program? How many of these families are, have, have they applied for rental assistance? Do they know that rental assistance exists? Like we have to start layering uh, the information beyond the slides that we're seeing today, because even those slides, we're going to have to dig deeper, as I said before, school by school, zip code by zip code. Um, it's all very helpful, and it's contiguous. It's not just, you know, once a year through the budget process. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an iterative process that we're all learning from constantly, um, and making adjustments, both in our executive branch or nonprofit sponsored programs and services as well, because I want to know if they're working. We're, we're investing a lot of money. Um, in extracurricular activities and services that are supposed to be improving academic achievement and not sure that they are. Um, and so those are the things that are beyond your control that we need to know as well to make informed decisions as a policy body. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think as we get into the accelerators, the point that, okay, so, you know, one could ask, you, you made, I'm just going to stick with our third graders because I have a third grader, uh, third grade uh, student who you, you made a five or six percentage point jump from last year to this year obviously some of that is probably you know there's pro multiple factors of mm -hmm. what that's attributed to right it, you know kids being back in the school you know what but I think when you ask okay well we want to make that growth every year and you want to accelerate it there has to be some nexus between well what did we do to get this because the accelerators were not in place and and so what more do we think we're going to get and what are we looking for to get past that you know you, you so there's that's a question i think that someone looking at this for the first time would ask like okay great in addition to the context of it's not great that only 40 percent of our third grade farm students are reading at the level they need to be right like that's the big you know we're we're talking about growth and, and i'm all for growth but that you know like that's the the bottom line of what this is saying so um so i just think to the extent that you can help us understand that and help the public understand that mm -hmm. as we move to the accelerators. I just wanted to frame that. So, yes. I just, just want to highlight that um, council staff has summarized some of the budget elements in the packet also on pages three to five just to show some of the specific accelerators related to the sections we're talking about now um, relative to their base elements in terms of positions and in terms of the dollars. It's not a, not a complete uh, category, but it does um, give a little more budget detail on some of those elements. Right, and so let's let's continue the thought then here. So under on page three of the packet, elementary and middle school math support accelerator. So you're going to get to that, but we're, let's start, where's where's the base position? Where, where's um, the, so on the next page, on page four. So okay. the the school system did provide the sort of large categories of the base on um, circles three to four. Um, at the bottom, I'm sorry, pay, I'm sorry, page three to four. Okay. Um, on the Bottom of page four and the beginning of page five, council staff did uh, compare sort of the existing allocation of those same positions with the requested new allocation of Great. those positions where we could identify those changes. So there's two supervisors, one in math, there's two supervisors, one elementary, one secondary, so we're talking about elementary right now, and there's seven instructional specialists. In the budget, there's a request for two additional administrators and then three instructional specialists right in this area and so when we get to that you'll talk about what that means in the context of 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 this data for example Does that, okay so your mic's off but yeah go ahead councilman ring um so as we're having this conversation um a, a suggestion maybe and my colleagues can let me know if this seems helpful but uh, for me, it would be helpful to have um, the presentation formatted in terms of like, here's the, the line item or the accelerator, and then here's the reason for it. So, you know, I don't want to exclude all the important data that you're presenting, but to have it formatted so that it's already linked, you know, we're talking about we're going to get to this later and, and we'll remember, you know, that we went over this. It would be helpful to bring those pieces together. Here are some of the line items that we pulled together, or some of the investments that, that, we're, that we're planning because of these particular particular trends and and you know these successes that we've that we've seen in this data and so on yeah that's kind of what I was just doing yeah. on my in my brain exactly real quick, just pulling all the pieces together I do right. think that's a that's a good point of let's have that let's refer back to this when we get to that to talk about it I think that's what we'll do in this context mm -hmm. but future I think yeah. it would be good to to look at it that way councilman Robert look like you were gonna say something yep. 
I was just going to say, duly noted. We've heard your comments and the questions that you've been asking and here thinking, you know, in future presentations. It'll definitely see the easier way for you to navigate the information. Thank you. Great. I intentionally had a second cup of coffee this morning, uh, so and I'm glad I did because this is a lot to process, and, and, and as it should be, uh, as, as we would expect. Um, and, and I don't know where, where to ask this, so I'm going to ask it now, and if we need to park it and better answer it later, that's fine. But so I, I just would like to better understand, so a third grader is falling well below literacy and math expectations. Um, what are we currently doing without the accelerators to provide support for that student? And how does that student automatically still go to fourth grade? Um, or how does, what does that look like? Because, you know, if, if, if a student is, is unfortunately for a, a number of different factors so far behind, but they're still continuing on, even with all of these supports, then how are we continuing to support them post those key breaking points sure um, to bring it to a real basic level if you think about a student in third grade in mathematics who is significantly behind which makes sense they've had two years of virtual instruction um, the very first thing we do is make sure that they still have access to grade level instruction in their basic math class meaning the teacher still has them working in the skills that they would need at that grade level, but they're also differentiating, making sure they're building in the scaffold so that what the student does know allows them to participate. Um, there are some really good examples of uh, what doesn't belong. Show four pieces in a qu quadrant, and the students are able to talk through that. That lets the teacher know what they do and don't know about the mathematics that they're getting ready to engage in. Beyond that, then there are interventions that can be done, and we have where we do have mathematics coaches, those math coaches are helping our teachers use those strategies to help students engage in the math at grade level, even if they do not have all the prerequisite skills and understanding. And then they're also able to help uh, deliver and monitor interventions in mathematics in addition to the class. Um, we've seen, and I think you'll hear a little bit later, that the math, where we do have math coaches, it is making a difference academically for the students who are benefiting from those services. And they just go on to fourth grade, though? That's a given? They are, they will have access to the core content, so they will have the, the essential skills that they need and access to that year over year. Some of those things do re repeat in years over year. And we do know what was missed during the pandemic and are intentionally making sure that we're embedding that in subsequent years. It's also in all of our interventions that we're doing and addressed through um, additional summer school opportunities to make sure that students can catch up and stay caught up. Um, so, I mean. So they go on to fourth grade regardless of where they are with their literacy and math scores, but you provide additional supports to try and help them as they go to fourth grade. That is correct. Okay, yeah, let's continue. Yep. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the next slide, thank you. So you're gonna see a series of slides here. We're focusing again on mathematics. Uh, we've broken this uh, information down. We're gonna look at grade three, grade six, and grade nine. If you look across uh, the bottom of the chart, you can see uh, we've broken this down by race and ethnicity, by students who are receiving farms or not receiving meal services. And again, the important thing to note here is what are we seeing with the trends? The gray bar is representing uh, last year. The red bar is representing uh, the current year. Um, and we are seeing uh, either some plateauing, but at a very high rate. We're also seeing some progress there in the middle of the chart among some of our students. And then we see students, um, you know, specifically black or African-American students and Hispanic students. While we are recognizing some progress there based on the previous years, we are not seeing them performing at the same level as their peers. So that, that's a, a bit of an overview there. Let's go to sixth grade. Again, we've arrayed the information somewhat in a similar way. You see a similar pattern here. But again, at sixth grade, we're seeing some pretty strong and positive growth. Uh, when you specifically look at uh, Hispanic uh, students and African-American students, receiving farms. You can see in some cases uh, the percentage points have almost doubled from 2022 to 2023. Again, uh, largely uh, the different identified groups here are performing below their peers, 
So what strategies do we need to be putting in place? Math is a, a significant area. Not only is it an issue here for us in Montgomery County, but it's an issue across the nation. So the scores, one of the things I just want to make a note of when we look at literacy here in just a minute, scores are going to look a little bit different because of some of the greater needs that we have with mathematics. Let's go to the next slide, please. And so then uh, this is us here looking at ninth grade. Again, a little bit of a different picture. Uh, we see some pretty consistent performance uh, here and also at a higher percentage points of students meeting the EOL benchmark. Um, again, concerns with some of the disparities, though, between the different student groups uh, and how they are performing. I'm going to shift now to looking at the same information, but we're going to talk a little bit about uh, literacy. Uh, and you can see on the left side, we're in the aggregate uh, by grades 3, 6, and 9. Uh, and again, uh, the gray bars represent the past year. The colored bars represent uh, the current year. Um, you know, a little bit of a dip in third grade, some nice performance, pretty uh, nice performance consistently across all of these data points for sixth grade. Um, and in ninth grade, we seem to be uh, relatively consistent uh, within the, you know, the range of 75 percent meeting those standards. When we now shift to, oh, let's go back uh, quickly. <laughs> when we shift to the, uh, the, right, the chart on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, similar information broken down by grade level uh, and by service groups. Um, you know, with the exception of uh, grade six, again, we're seeing some nice progress, but pretty much uh, flat or consistent uh, performance in grades three through nine uh, between uh, 2022-2023 school year. All right, let's go to the next slide. And then we've arrayed the information similar to how we've um, provided it with the mathematics, uh, the, uh, the grade three literacy, uh, and again, very much some of the similar patterns that we'd seen in uh, previous information, uh, concerns specifically around uh, students who are receiving uh, meals with African American and Hispanic students. When we shift to grade six, we do see a, a little bit of a different picture uh, with a stronger performance um, and some stronger gains uh, than the third graders. And then when we look at grade nine, um, next slide please, uh, we can see some a relatively strong or uh, consistent performance across these grade levels. While we do see existing gaps between uh, different peer groups, uh, we do have pretty consistent high performance uh, in some areas and we are seeing um, some, you know, some gains specifically looking at Hispanic and Latino students not receiving uh, meal services going from 56 to, to 73. So I will stop there, uh, Councilman Juwando. I know we've been having ongoing discussion. I don't know if there's any questions or we're ready to move on to the next uh, part of the yeah. presentation. Uh, you have a question. Yeah, if you could just go back to the one. I just, did you explain the ninth grade, the, the research on this? Because I do think, obviously, this is concerning in that our ninth grade students, black and Latino students, I don't know if you mentioned this before, but they have gone down in the last year. Uh, so I just think we need to contextualize this a little more and, and talk about what we're doing, because that's obviously a critical year as they head into 10th grade and, and what we're doing to try to make sure that we're providing supports for those students. Right, so some of the research that will be referenced at the end is really showing that it takes three to five years for students, the younger students, to make those gains that we're expecting. Um, and that when you're an older student and you've missed routine gaps in your learning, it's harder to make that progress. It makes sense because the difficulty level of the work is, is increasing and becoming more rigorous and you have had more years um, of learning in a particular way. So what the research is saying is that you have a better potential to help students catch up and make ground in the early years and that in the later years, it takes longer for them to recover from learning loss. Yeah, okay. I know Councilor Alvarez and then Councilor Irving. I know this is a very broad question, um, but how is this information communicated to the schools and the administrators? So obviously we're looking at things at a macro level, but what does it look like to, you know, if, if a school in general, for whatever reason, 
is not performing as well as a corresponding school? Um, and how are folks, how, how are we tracking success um, within those individual schools and ensuring accountability at the actual school level? So the evidence of learning uh, comes to mind because that is the tool that has been established in MCPS for the past few years that uh, our administrators use and, and deliberately plan their school improvement work around that. So they are aware because they have the platforms to be able to work with their staff to say, you know, this is exactly how we're doing. What we, I'm going to marry the pathways to this because what we now have is the pathways that outline the specific milestones that we want students to meet in each of those grade levels. So now they're going to even be able to better use that evidence of learning data that they already have to say, okay, how close or far are our students away from these milestones in these particular grade levels? Let's take, for instance, you know, of course they can look at third grade reading in the pathways, but it's so powerful for our first and second grade teachers to know this is where we want, this is where they're headed for third grade. Where are they in these in, um, intermediate years to be able to see how close or far they are on track to that? So that's the, that's the great news, the consistent part in our administrators being able to be aware and teachers of um, how this marries up nicely to the pathways is it's the evidence of learning. And our school supervisors, I mean, this is their work. Their, their work is to actually use the evidence of learning data to be able to go out and engage with principals and staff and coaches from central office to be able to differentiate the resources that we have available to us to say, okay, this school, you know, within the district is you know definitely struggling to meet these milestones how are we working with them and utilizing differentiating the resources to help them meet their needs so that's helpful and then just um the other the transition between fifth to sixth grade the transition between eighth to ninth grade yeah. you know can be uh, very um, challenging for students obviously and their families as a whole and uh, could you just and and it's tough for administrators too um, because we we haven't talked about social and emotional learning. I know MCPS a number of years ago began the the development of a tracking system to track social and emotional because we know that's that's just as important in many ways as sort of academic outcomes. The two are inextricably linked, um, and there had been some efforts made to better connect that information so that when the transition did happen for students to the different school that the administrators and the staff would be as best prepared as possible to be able to um, help that student transition from elementary to middle and then middle to high school. I know this is a high level, but just can you talk about that transition and how we're tracking social and emotional learning on a parallel track? Well, the social emotional piece, I think we're going to get into in just a little bit here when we come back and talk about mm -hmm. safety and well-being overall those pieces. So I think we're going to get into some of that and, and we can get as deep or as specific as you want us to work or return. Um, but that transition is very important. Um, one of the great things about us being back in person and consistently um, and through most ways of the pandemic is that we are able to return to much of the vertical articulation process that happens between those critical years of students transitioning from elementary to middle and from middle to high. One of the accelerators that I'll point to um, that we're going to talk about here shortly is just, um, and the name of the position is escaping my mind right now, but it's that in middle school, the coaches, the opportunity specialists. One of the goals of the opportunity specialists is not just to look at the data to work with the school teams to say these students are not meeting the targets and focusing on them with a laser focus of using and differentiating resources, but also to be able to help with those transition pieces. What we've realized, and, and one thing we've tried to elevate in this budget is, um, we're trying to connect or put the puzzle together better and not have the mix match, I would say. So for instance, we know we have the opera, um, equal opportunity specialists in some of our schools that have struggled to meet some of the milestones. Um, what we recognize is that we did not have that same level of support in middle school so that that specialist in the high school can connect with uh, the specialists 
in middle, well, we didn't have, a, we don't have a specialist in middle school, and that's the purpose of this position, because we want to make the transition easier, because if there is a ninth grader going into ninth grade, and we've put these things in place, and the support seem to not be working, or if there's a part that a student is navigating outside of school that's impacting them, the more information that the high school may have to help support that student, they don't have to wait until something happens, right, to then be reactive to it. But having that correlation and those specialists connect with the coaches in the high school allows us to set up the opportunity for students to be even more successful, especially if they are navigating different circumstances and need to move into a different school with someone knowing how they're, they're, they have to be supported differently. So that's the intention of, of that, uh, that specialist, in, uh, those specialist positions within our middle schools is to actually get at that very transition piece. And that's going to be really important because this blueprint requirement, we're backing up how we measure students' readiness for college and career now to 10th grade, before it was 11th grade. Now it's 10th. So it's even more important for us to make sure that as students move into the ninth grade, that we've taken into consideration who they are, their needs, and that communication that has to be in place for them to be successful. Councilman May. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking at the the grade three numbers where we're seeing, uh, you know, where we're not seeing increases, and um, and just noting that elementary school teachers are under, uh, you know, really unique pressures. Um, I mean, they have those kids, you know, pretty much all day, and so, you know, it's hard to come by planning time, uh, and that's gonna that's gonna impact the, the service that they're able to deliver. And so, you know, I was just curious what thinking um, you've done, and I know we'll get to some of the specifics, um, but, uh, but what, just while we're looking at this side about, you know, what thinking you all have done about ways to alleviate that pressure to, um, to create more planning time for teachers, uh, especially in elementary schools. So I will not go into details because I am going to honor the, the positions of our negotiations teams to work through that process, but I will tell you some of the higher level thinking that the system has bought that actually brings it to the table, um, this very issue. So as I said before, when you think about an elementary school day and an elementary school structure, um, and again, I, I remember my days of teaching elementary school like yesterday, and you are correct. There's a lot going on. You're spending a lot of your time with the students directly. Um, and it is a different design in our secondary schools. But I'm also not going to rush to say, given all the things that we have to take into consideration, increasing a teacher's capacity around understanding um, data evaluation and the analysis of what helps the students meet proficiency level when they're trying to define a concept. And I'm going to use our new teacher as an example. I'm going to I'll use that as an example. A new teacher come into the profession for the first time. Um, I remember that like it was yesterday as well. I mean, <laughs> you're overwhelmed. You're with children who have many needs, who are you're building relationships. You're thinking about all these concepts that you have to teach while you're learning to be a teacher at the same time. So that does have to be time in which you are provided support in how you are figuring out how to define proficiency for a student. In the classroom of 24 students, I'll say that's what I'll go to in my first year of teaching, that meant for every single student I had to be able to look at what is it that is preventing the student from understanding this concept or what's helping these students understand the concept and move forward. So that meant that I didn't particularly know in how to teach skills, how to define that. That came through Yes, some collaboration with others to help me do that. And so as we have this conversation about planning time, here's the system's interest. To be able to make sure there's time for teachers to independently do what they need to do, and we know that includes grading, making preparations for the lesson plans that they have to have, but it also means there has to be time in which they get the support that they need, as I stated earlier in my opening comments, to help them become very proficient in what they need to become proficient in, and that's meeting the skills of all of the students that we see in these graphs that may have a number of things that need to be taken into consideration to make sure that they are being successful. So that's the system's interest in bringing that conversation to the forefront in negotiations. How do we best do that? And to be completely frank with you, I think we have to design that. We have to design that. The system has been 
um, Montgomery County Public Schools and, and probably many other elementary schools that exist have had schedules that have exist that, that is pushed by the time that students are supposed to be in school, what time the school day starts, what time it ends, and when students are and when students are not with their primary teacher, particularly in elementary school, then who are they with? Um, and so I think that takes time. And so one of the things that we have been in much conversation about is what does that need to look like? And who are the people? And I would be first to say it's our teachers that have to be a critical part of the conversation in designing that, along with principals and others who are, are navigating those different circumstances. Um, and I appreciate you you saying that our teachers have to be a critical part of designing that. And as a, as a former teacher, I've been a new teacher, I've been a not new teacher, and, and certainly I won't deny that, the, that having a good coach um, is helpful. But I really want to emphasize that like the first thing that a teacher needs to be successful is adequate planning time, individual planning time for them to work out what they're going to be doing, you know, the next day, over the next week, over the quarter, and so on. If you don't have that, all the coaching in the world is just eating into more time you'd rather spend on, on planning, to be, to be very frank. You can get a lot of good advice about what your plans should look like, but if you don't have time to go back and reflect on that and then write, write a plan that's putting that into motion, um, that coach, again, is just, is just eating into your own. So like, there's definitely, I think, an order of events that has to happen in terms of what are we giving to our teachers. And the first thing, I mean, I think elementary school teachers have less than four hours a week right now of planning time. I mean, that, I don't know how that's possible. To me, that's saying, we are expecting you to use unpaid time outside of school hours because there's no way for them to be able to provide and, and to create a, an adequate you know, plan for the next day, much less being able to take time to think about how did the last week go, let me think about how that should inform the next, the next month um, and like reshape things or to take your coach's advice and, and reshape things. So, you know, I, I would really urge you as you have those negotiations with the teachers and I think that's, um, that it's so important what you said that, that you want to be informed by what the teachers say. If the teachers are saying, yes, we would prioritize co you know, more coaching and having that worked in systemically over more, over more planning time, then so be it. I, you know, I would, and, I, and I think actually finding ways to incorporate, um, to incorporate the voices of those teachers into these presentations so we can kind of, um, uh, you know, as just another data point of here's what informed this decision or that decision, that would be something helpful to think about. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly as a teacher in my conversations, you know, that I had with teachers, the first thing that we always wanted was to make sure that we protected that planning time. I can't do anything and be successful if I'm having to scrap and pull together things and try to make last minute adjustments, much less, you know, trying to give the extra support that's needed to our students who have, have the most needs and trying to, you know, scaffold and all of the extras that our wonderful, you know, teachers are, are trying to do. And so my concern is if we're, um, if we're looking at places where we're not making increases and saying, well, it's because our, our teachers aren't doing things right, let's provide more coaching, we've, we've, but, but they don't have adequate planning time, then I, then I think that we've, we've missed a, p a huge piece of the puzzle here. So um, it, it sounds like um, you know, you're having these conversations with, with the teachers, um, but my hope is that you know, we're, you're coming out of that with some good collaborative ideas about how to create that adequate planning and protect that adequate planning time. And so like to have it scheduled in with less than four hours, I just, I just don't see how we can defend that. Um, and especially when, uh, and I know that you're working to address staffing issues also, but if they're, as it is right now, they're also, they're covering for other, for other teachers. Um, and so I would just urge you, if you're looking at the balance between coaches and more supervisors and all of that versus finding ways to have more teachers, uh, and, and also to, to find more planning time, whether that's incorporating more specials or, or whatever it is, um, that we start with that because it's very hard to judge the use of anything like coaches or, or new programs that the teachers are implementing if we know that they don't have what they need to be able to put together an adequate lesson plan for the next day, next, next week, the quarter, and so on. Yeah, thank you so much for your comments on that. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I think it's, it's not either or, I think it's both. And I, I kind of start the presentation with that. Um, I don't think it's tinkering around the edges. I think there are some things that time needs to be spent to actually build that out. I believe if the answer was to provide 
one silver bullet for all 210 schools, 162,000 students, we actually would not see much of what we've talked about in the data in terms of the gaps that exist. I do. I believe if, if, if I could say, you know, I think this is going to be the one thing that solves much of what I'm seeing in terms of disparities in the data, I, I can't sum it to one, one piece. Um, in the theory of action, I talked about the importance of differentiating resources. Some of our schools in Montgomery County Public Schools do have different models of planning time. As a matter of fact, one of the pieces that we've recommended is really looking at where are we seeing the planning time actually um, make a difference in terms of student learning and the, the, the opportunity for teachers to be able to provide more of that laser-like focus for the specific needs of all of these students in the way that they need to do so. And so I think that we have to follow that data and that research that informs us in terms of what works um, and then what we need to enhance, while at the same time building infrastructures that, that do not exist. And um, someone asked the question about, you know, how our schools are doing. It's one of the things our Board of, Education's charged, Board of Education charged us to do, which was we want to know how schools are doing overall, because when we look at those schools, then we are wanting and expecting the system to come back and talk to us about how you're differentiating those resources in those schools. And I think it's planning time um, is one component, but it's one of many components. I also think it is building the capacity of all of the educators to have the expectations for the students laid out and figuring out the best way to do that for the students that exist in all of these numbers that we're talking about. I think it's really deep uh, digging into the curriculum to understand how is it that I'm teaching the curriculum in a way that meets the needs of all of these students that exist. and. Yeah, there's not enough time in the day to do all no, of that. I appreciate right? that, <laughs> and and I just we will come back to this. You guys are negotiating on this topic right now. Um, there will be, you know, it's not going to be solved in one. You're going to have to get input and figure it out. Um, yes. That's why we need a longer school day, by the way. Just I'll just put in my plug for that. Um, but um, so, but I just want us to get to the accelerators here, so we can. Yes. But but I appreciate the engagement on this. I think it's an important point, and. We need to, uh, it's something I, as I've said to you before, privately and publicly, it's something I hear from teachers all the time. Uh, I've seen it with I have two elementary MCPS students, and I, I know how hard their teachers work. So um, I know you've heard that, and you're trying to achieve that balance, both in negotiations now, but also planning going forward. So we appreciate that. All right, let's go to the, let's skip, skip this. There we go. Let's get into the base. All right. And, and at, uh, Ms. Guire, if there's anything you want to chime in on any of this, please let me know. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Thank you. Um, what are we doing right now, and, and, and so what more needs to, to be done? The, I know the uh, Education and Culture Committee expressed an interest in hearing a little bit more about the base budget. And while the accelerators that we are identifying areas to strengthen, there's evidence that a, a strong core mathematic and literacy instruction are going on in our schools. That's playing itself out in some of the data that we've shared with you. Uh, while there are a variety of supports that wrap around our teachers and our classrooms, it's also important to recognize that every teacher in our elementary schools and teachers across all of our content areas in our high and middle schools play a role in developing student literacy and mathematics skills. Some of these things are just not happening, um, you know, incidentally. The base budget or same service budget includes $51 million of the total budget to support our teachers. And that includes expert coaching through staffing, evidence-based learning curriculum materials, professional learning, and additional services to, to supplement the classroom instruction. So I know the, the group wanted to talk about that. We wanted to give you a snapshot of how that was included in the budget. Um, and I don't know if you want to stop there or you'd like me to continue. So the question is, for my colleague, what, are we going to get more specific into what this means? So maybe, Mr. There, Weyer, if, if there's any questions you think. There's yeah, just a ahead. little bit of more okay. detail in the packet, not um, perhaps not the level of specificity that you're interested in, but there's a little more description of each of these sections on the bottom of page three and the top of page four. Um, council staff also um, went into the budget document to try to break out what's in the school-based positions, and that's listed on page five of your packet. <laughs> Do you want to ask a question about any of that? Yeah. 
Okay, yes, go ahead, Councilman. <laughs> Um, thanks. Yeah, here's where it would just be great to have more insight into decisions. I'm looking at the breakdown of positions in the packet, which is on um, uh, four and five. Uh, you know, supervisors, instructional specialists. So in making the decisions about whether we're adding instructional specialists, for example, um, literacy coaches versus, you know, other positions, more uh, you know, more teachers, more paras, that kind of thing. It would just be helpful to get more insight into that. And I'm also, you know, hearkening back to what we just talked about, about the importance of making sure that our folks have adequate time, um, you know, to, to do their planning and, and enough people to make sure that they're not being pulled into, into other roles. Uh, and, and just noting that I, I completely agree, um, Dr. McKnight, with what you were saying about that we have to be able to do to do both. I mean, I think that that's completely accurate. We um, we have we have a lot of things that we need to accomplish, a, a lot of goals, and a lot of students who we're serving, and we have to take a, a multi-pronged approach here. Um, I would also put, you know, adequate work time, um, making sure that our teachers have the time to get what they need to get done during the hours that they're being paid for. Um, you know, I would put that in, in like a, a, a different category than some of the other accelerators. Um, like to me, that's, you know, just like for our, our buildings, we, you have to have a building that's going to stand up. It's got to have a roof. We got to have air conditioning. You know, those are all things that we all recognize. Like, like that's our very, very baseline. I would put, you know, teacher time into that as well. You know, the other things just don't work if we don't, if we don't have that. If that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Next slide, please. Uh, we've talked extensively about the theory of action, so I'm going to move on from this quickly. But you can see just clarifying expectations, increasing adult expertise, which we've talked a lot about this morning, and then improving outcomes through a strong accountability structure. Uh, and that's reinforced here in, in just a minute with the accelerators. I do want to highlight also that we recently are coming off um, the findings of the anti-racism audit. And those recommendations are going to be forthcoming here in May to the board as far as action plan. Uh, what we see with the anti-racism audit and asking these questions is making sure we are take, making decisions and actions that focus on anti-racism uh, solutions and that we are creating equity across the district for all students. So whom do these decisions or whom does this practice or decision serve or neglect? Whose voices are dominant? or lacking from the conversation, what adverse impacts or unintended consequences could result from these decisions, what steps are in place for ongoing data collection and reflection, and what, how diverse are the stakeholders leading the implementation. I'm going to take just a small segue here, uh, Councilman Alvernos, and I just want to, uh, you know, maybe a further discussion we have offline is with our school supervisors. They work directly with schools on school improvement plans. Those plans are going to be posted to websites. They regularly update those. And these, for instance, are just some of the questions that they ask when they go out to schools and monitor their academic performance and data on a regular basis. And so I think that, again, is becoming part of our culture as far as how those decisions are made, making sure we take the appropriate actions, and how are we creating equity, because you can see there are differences in equity across some of the things that are happening, I'll harken back to uh, when we talked about AP, uh, you know, participation and making the exams available. So next slide, please. The data tells us, um, the data tells us that we must continue to make progress for all students while eliminating disparities. And that's played itself out, I think, very clearly here this morning. The theory of action tells us how we will do that and then the key levers or strategies to address those performance. The accelerators are the investments that we need to make, and they're aligned with those strategies. So let's go to the next slide. I think you've seen this before. So this is a breakdown of how the accelerators look, and then the accountability structures that are wrapped around that. And if we look, um, for instance, uh, at the building staff capacity, uh, the number of accelerators uh, that we uh, have uh, that are part of this that are devoted to building staff capacity are 33 percent of uh, the the total with just slightly over 15.5 um, million dollars the second set of accelerators which make up 67 percent of the total are devoted to targeting resources uh, to our students uh, at a total of just over 31 million dollars let's go to the next slide 
So here's, I think, the information that we've been leading to um, and that we want to discuss in a little bit more detail. So I'll acclimate you to the slide. First, to the key up in the upper right-hand corner, we've identified those areas that are going to be building staff capacity in the orange, and those that are going to be differentiating resources and support in the blue. We've also provided um, an asterisk next to those that are directly aligned with the Maryland blueprint. So a lot of these actions we are taking um, fit you know, very nicely into the pathway, but also fit uh, into the, the blueprint. I'm going to give you some examples at this point. So one of the levers uh, that we have here is uh, funding through differentiating resources for some of our youngest learners in pre-K, which is an area that we want to continue to grow across the county. In the accelerator this year, we have preschool education program, otherwise referred to as PAP. And this is expanding the pre-K opportunity for some of our youngest students who are receiving special education services. When we transition to high school, we are intensifying the college networks and providing support for first-generation college-going students. So again, it gets back to Councilman Albernos. Providing for those transitions, how do students transition from middle to high school or even prepare in upper elementary? And we want to make sure we're bringing that conversation out. We also have uh, improvement levers built into staff capacity, and that's uh, represented by consulting teachers and counselors who serve as key assets for our first year and continuing uh, teachers and counselors and providing support. The same is true for our mathematical coaches who are working side by side uh, by teachers and providing them expert teach and teaching skills. So let's jump to the next slide and I think this provides even a little bit more detail of where we are and what we look like today. So the information that is represented on the slide is the current state of how we have staff in position to support mathematics across our schools. They are divided into two areas, elementary and secondary, and these are content uh, supervisors. You can see that based on how those staff are deployed at the elementary level, we have a ratio of one staff to 45 schools. The same is true when you look at the secondary schools, middle and high school, a total of 66 schools, and the ratio there is uh, 1 to 17. Before you move off of that, just explain an elementary content supervisor and secondary content supervisor and the role that they fulfill and why a 1 to 45 ratio is not ideal for the role that they fill and in in, in why you're asking to reduce it, please. Absolutely. Thank you. The um, If you look, it's important, I'll, I'll skip to the secondary very quickly, the 1 to 17 ratio is much less, but you have many more math discrete math courses uh, in a school, so they're still serving teachers and working with them on a variety of um, coursework. But the 1 to 45, when you're looking at our content specialists, the content specialists are those who are actually looking at the standards deeply. They understand what our assessments are. They're helping to implement curriculum currently, but they're having to work with teachers who are not fully released. They're called math leaders um, in a school who, who may have an extra period for, for which weekend those, those content specialists can communicate information to them about what's upcoming in the curriculum, to do that curriculum study, to understand the depth of level of what students are being asked to do, which is different than how most all of our teachers were classically trained. And so what we're finding is that 1 to 45 does not allow us to differentiate our resources. It doesn't allow us to spend more time in the schools that they need to be spending time with, where we have newer teachers, where we have significant performance deficits. And so for us to even be able to be in the schools on a more routine and regular basis, working side by side with the teachers, we need to expand our capacity. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Rowland. That makes sense, but even embedded within this capacity, there's higher needs within those from 136 to 66, but not all those 66 schools are going to be the same. So how, how are you currently, and then how would you, if this is, you know, uh, approved, um, sort of focus on those schools that really need the most assistance? So I just, I want to make a point here, um, and that is that to arrive at this decision, what we did was we looked at the evidence of learning data from this uh, past year, 
and we compared it to schools, as we mentioned earlier on, that do have some dedicated math leaders in their school. We compared it to those that do and those that don't. And what we noted in the data were that those that did have those math leads were making significant gains uh, as compared to those that don't. So that's the rationale, and that's a data-driven dri decision behind that. You can also see that the ratios based on the deployment of the content specialists and the, the coaches who are going to be assigned to schools, these are not central office positions, these are school positions, change dramatically from 1 to 45 to 1 to 10, and these are single-digit <coughs> numbers, and we've also broken it out between middle and high school. So we have greater supports. We recognize specifically with mathematics because some of the things that have happened sort of um, nationally with that, we need to make this type of effort to be able to get our students performing at the levels that we want to see. And I'll also add to that, um, we've been astute to the data because going back to the theory of action, differentiating the resources, it's to your very point in asking that question, Council Member um, Albernaz. In the Board of Education, I've had many conversations about this. We are looking at our schools and who needs that support and actually moving the resources as necessary. So the goal is just as you would in a classroom. You know, you may introduce information, um, and then after you teach that information, you want to be able to see how much are the students able to do independently, because that shows you if the learning has truly occurred or not. Same thing with how we use the resources. Um, right now we're talking about coaches, but we've also used this model with our restorative justice specialists and other positions to support um, mental health for our students. Um, looking at the schools that show that they have the most need, deploying those resources in those spaces more intensely, and when we're able to see that growth and progress is being made, looking and studying what were some of those practices that they have now adapted within that school that's led to that progress and continue to monitor that so that we can lessen the support and then redistribute as appropriate. I think it's the best example of how that theory of action really does come to life when you think about differentiation of resources and saying that should be able to be um, very versatile in how we utilize those resources in the school system based on need. And then I'm not familiar with these positions specifically, and I appreciated the, the overview. And I'm new to this committee, so it's going to take me a little while to get my bearings straight. Um, and while I've had many interactions with the school system from many different angles over the years, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I haven't been one. I wish I had uh, directly, and I just have such respect um, for the profession and, and, and this work. But if you could, what what's the... What do these positions look like? I mean, you know, these are are these former teachers? Are these folks that have received some additional level of training? Clearly, they have, but I get the importance of this position um, and wanting to make it easier and not as overwhelming as it is currently for them to be able to do their jobs more effectively. But that next step, that connection to the classroom, and it goes back to something I said at the beginning of our discussion, how does this translate to support for the teacher in the classroom? Like, what does that look like? Absolutely. Um, and it's important to note that number-wise, this is still not consistent with what other counties have in terms of supporting mathematics. Number-wise, if you think about it, you have pre-K, K, one, two, three, four, and five in grades in elementary. And our teachers who have expertise in teaching, who know their students, need a person who has expertise in that grade level standard. Because that is what's changed for them. What has changed for them is that, you know, when the standards changed and then our curricula changed, they need someone to help um, make sure that what they're doing and what they're planning is at the level of rigor that's designed. Students will not have success on external assessments if they don't ever get exposed to the level of rigor. And it's new for our teachers because we're asking students to be able to, as Dr. McKnight said, not only learn the mathematical concepts, but transfer them independently and know when and how to use them. Way beyond memorization, way beyond calculation, way beyond, um, this is a deep conceptual understanding of mathematics so that they can enter into solving 
word problems. So what a specialist can do is really take where uh, the professional teachers are and help them make sure that what they're doing at that level is at the level of rigor and then can share those practices. Because we do have math teachers across the district in elementary level who are exceeding and doing well with their students. And taking those practices and making sure we have an effective way to share those practices among the schools. So this person would be fully deployed to schools, but they're also accessible for that continued professional development themselves. They are ones who, as they're seeing what the problems of practice are in their schools, can come back and go, and go to additional professional learning specifically around what it is that their schools and students need. Yeah, so cool. Thanks. Yeah, and, and, and again, so one to ten, as you said, is not ideal because that's one to ten schools of seven, five to seven hundred students Correct. across five grades, right? So just for the context of that and, and supporting those, those teachers and students in those buildings. Um, okay, uh, you have a question on the previous slide, right? Mm -hmm. Councilmember uh, Mink. Thanks. If we could, accelerator side. yes, we go back to the accelerator yeah. side. I just wanted to um, dig into a couple of these, if we could. Um, the English language development um, piece. Are those folks going to be school-based or centrally located? Those are school-based, based on enrollment. Great. And then, um, how are you? Oh, based on enrollment. And can you say more about that? So actually this will help us catch up maybe to where we've had an influx of new students coming in who need language services. So this will, will help and so consequently the English learning development teachers caseload has increased. Um, and budget years are behind, right? So these students who came, came be, and weren't accounted for it formulaically in how we staffed our schools. This is to alleviate that consistent and current pressure that we have having many students who have needs um, ba based on the number of students and where they're located. So those 40 students will bring us up to a better level of making sure that it's manageable for teachers. For not 40 students. Teachers. 40 teachers. Teachers, right? yeah. 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 Um, that's great. Yeah, working to alleviate the caseload is, you know, benefits everyone and is critically important. Yeah. I think it's an important point also to raise just for an awareness, and I think Councilman Albert knows, uh, refers to this often. What we see in this region of the country, and it's not to say the phenomenon doesn't happen across the country, is typically we see a number of families moving here during the middle of the school year who may need some additional services. So this is also part of preparing so we have those services available to them. And that could be a good tie between the schools and the county government as we kind of think out over the horizon. Um, I also wanted to check in about the innovative calendar school since we've had some of that in place and are looking to in, uh, invest more. Can you talk about some of the um, metrics or data that you've used to decide to, to expand? So one of the things uh, we're excited about some of the progress that we are seeing at our innovative calendar schools as well as our two-way immersion schools. There's an interest in that uh, and we see the importance of more time for students, more time for learning. One of the things though is the ramp up or the pre preparation to put those in place, work with communities, uh, get staff in place and make sure that there's enough planning time. This year in the budget that the intention is that we put that planning in place to look at how we expand that and coupled with we want to go back and look at the current models that we're having in place, make sure that we have strong accountability systems in place and that we're seeing the progress that we want to make sure is happening. And some of those schools, some of that progress is, is very positive and we want to be able to build on that. And we actually did a, um, a report to the Board of Education about our innovative calendar schools and even despite the fact that most of the years of that model have been during the pandemic, we were able to see slight increases in terms of students' performance. So we're happy to forward that over to you as well. And take a look at that. Yeah, I think that kind of data would be would be really helpful both for the uh, two-way emergent schools and the innovative calendar schools. As you, you know, you mentioned that you see the see the value of extra of extra time, like what does that look like? What is that value being reflected? And certainly, theoretically, um, I can understand the, the added value of having more time, but what are the results that we're seeing on the ground? Are we seeing what we, what we anticipate? What is the data that's actually informing, you know, ramping up this continued investment now versus um, either scaling back or working to collect more, more data from what's currently in place? 
And I'll say that also connects to the theory of action as far as um, how we deploy resources based on what the needs are of different communities. We're obviously not going to deploy this universally across the entire district, but what are families, what are communities interested in, and then how do we differentiate those resources as we deploy them? Yeah, absolutely. Feedback from families would be really important. Taking uh, feedback from from teachers. Are we continuing to? Ha are those schools able to stay staffed? Uh, you know, all of all of those pieces would be good to know as we think about moving moving forward and, and enhancing uh, potentially you know investment here. I'm going to skip us forward. I think if we can yep. move forward to yeah yes here. Um, so I want to put another lens up here uh, for you and uh, with the pathways document as far as how then the different accelerators tie directly to uh, particular levels and then associated with the milestones that we have connected. So for instance, at the high school level, we've created accelerators around dual enrollment, uh, AP and IB and the college network, all, you know, by the way, all connected with the Maryland blueprint. At the middle school, we've talked a little bit about the academic opportunity specialist and how important that is to transition from students moving from middle to high. Uh, and strengthening that pathway because ultimately we see that as a part of reflecting out in our graduation numbers and then students pursuing post-secondary opportunities. And then at the elementary level, aligned to the blueprint, we're increasing the, the PEP program and continue to look at how we're going to grow the pre-K programs, supporting 504 planning, inc increasing classroom instruction, which we've mentioned uh, with uh, supports to mathematics and literacy. Next slide. The final element that we want to bring back to you that we recently presented to the school board uh, last week is around the accountability steps. And so we're going to look at some of the things that we are doing uh, specifically related to accountability. Uh, the first is around what I'm calling formal program evaluation. And I know there were questions about, can you tell me about the formal pr uh, program evaluation? If you go to the website and we'll provide the information to you what programs that we are looking at that are in that formal evaluation program. A lot of those were associated with uh, funding that was coming through ESSERF, and so uh, the board rec and the superintendent wanted to make sure that we were closely monitoring those programs. What we've put in place or what we've changed is that now we have, um, you know, uh, a, uh, a measure, I guess, to determine whether we either continue a program uh, we give it a one-year sort of hiatus um, with if we're not seeing the improvement we want or we discontinue uh, implementing the program because we're not seeing the results. I do want to bring us back, though. It's going to take three to five years when we initiate a program or, you know, move it forward. But in the recent, you know, as recent as 12 months, implementing this system, we have, you know, made decisions about discontinuing some of our programs based on the fact that we were not getting the results that we wanted to see. And so how can we then take those resources and either realign them or push them in another direction or just discontinue them? And there, there are some examples that we've been able to do that. So that's sort of level one, and I'll stop there. I see uh, Councilman Juwando. Yeah, you're, thank you. You're, you're perked. No, I just want you to give an example. I think this is really important. You know, we've been talking about the accountability. The public has been talking about it. My colleagues and I have been talking about it. this committee. We've been talking about it, yeah. how we're going to set up a uh, kind of a comprehensive system uh, and how you are approaching it. And I think this is important to note that you this is new. Yeah. Right. You, you weren't doing this. Um, and. So I, I would love you to give a, a specific example or two of something that you discontinued because you found it wasn't working, okay. and uh, and how that's going to move, how you're going to use that process going forward. Okay. So I'll identify them by examples, and I'll identify the first example uh, for you. Before I do that, though, let me give you a little bit of background. So we're going through the formal evaluation process, and we produce evaluation reports. And that's pretty standard or pretty typical. And then those reports are made public. The relationship between what the report says, I recommend that you increase time, I recommend that you uh, provide professional learning, whatever those recommendations are, there's got to be a link of accountability between what those recommendations are and what the action is of the program manager. 
So the first step is, as the evaluations roll out, we are going to hold the program manager accountable for an action plan. So if I recommend that we increase professional development, then the program man manager has to develop a plan for how they are going to accomplish that. And that plan will be then checked if that is or isn't happening. So the linkages between the recommendations and the evaluation and what the program manager's action will be is going to be one measure and then we will check whether that is happening or not. So that's step one. And as the evaluations go through first year, second year, third year, we will be checking along the way. Now, if we're not, if that's all lined up and that's happening, but we're not seeing the results that we want to see and we're entering the third year, then the discussion with the program manager is, we're going to continue to implement this for one more year, but we've gotten to the point where unless we begin to see the results that we had anticipated or planned for, this program is going to be eliminated. So that's the yellow. That's the yellow, correct. Okay. So you, 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 you get a sense that it's not working, you decide that you want to discontinue, you give a, a yellow year yeah. of continuation, and right. then, okay, so keep going. Yeah. And then the same is true if we're seeing the results that we want to see, and we've got good action plans in place based on recommendations, then we're going to either continue to implement or grow the program. A lot of the things that school districts do are pilots. They do small-scale pilots to see if they're working, they work out the kinks, they make sure implementation's going along well, and then if we're at a precipice with a particular program that's relatively small and we want to see it be able to continue it, then that would be the linchpin to say, okay, we want to expand this to more schools based on whatever that, that need may look like. If we get to the point in the example where we've come off the third year, we've been on a, we're going to look at this in one year and make a decision, we're still not seeing the results, then we need to make the decision about simply stopping or eliminating the program. And that's been true um, in the case of the two programs that I, I mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I don't, did you mention the two programs? No, I did not. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think you did. I know you've mentioned them probably in other conversations yeah. before today. Can you yeah. mention the programs that you Sure. Uh, one is a small-scale reading program, which was actually a pilot and at the elementary level. And the other one is Leader in Me, which I know has um, been a topic of discussion uh, that we've had. So we're trying to make a transition, uh, some transition here you know, around the priority of well-being um, and make sure we don't have a gap. So there's, And what's the cost of those programs that you're phasing out? Um, the, uh, the one, um, for instance, the leader and me, um, we were into the, uh, the way that program was set up was through cohorts. So that it was initiated through three different cohorts. We were at the stage of implementing the third cohort, and I think that was uh, close to $5 million dollars to continue with cohorts um, one, two, and initiate three. Um, and so what we've elected to do is stop, but we are going to uh, provide in this transition period an a la carte menu, I guess. We want to make sure we don't have a gap where there's no well-being supports. Some schools are being successful with Leader and Me. Other schools, they may want to transition to some other type of well-being um, support system. And I mentioned uh, to Councilman Albernos school improvement planning earlier in the discussion. That's going to be tied into their school improvement plan, so it's linked to that accountability. There are other things, academic performance is in there, culture is in there, and also well-being. So again, we're, we're trying to link these things and connect sure. them and have that accountability in place for our school-based supervisors and our principals and our teachers all to monitor together. I appreciate that. I'm going to turn to Councilman Robinson in one second. I just think something for President Silvestri and the, the, the letter that you've sent us, the conversations we've been having about accountability, I think this is going to be an important part of it. You know, you all will obviously at the board review this with the school system. I think there's, in our joint meetings and the ENC meetings, we should be talking about, on an, you know, several times during the year, how are things going, what are pro, what's that list of programs that you're evaluating so we all are aware of it. Um, where is it in the various stages of evaluation? And, you know, I think that's something I want to make sure we come back to. So just wanted to mention that uh, in, com in collaboration with the board. Um, Councilman Robinus. I agree with all that, and I do appreciate this. This is, um, this is good. Um, but, you know, I've, I've been 
involved in many different programs over many different years, um, you know, with, with evaluation. And evaluation is complicated, right? I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're track if it's a program that's supposed to be focusing on improving math scores, but we're not improving math scores, well, that's pretty straightforward. But more often than not, it's not straightforward. Um, and where we solicit information to determine whether or not something's successful is also important. Um, and it, it is, you know, you can have the best curriculum in the world, but it depends on who's carrying out that curriculum and their comfort level with it on whether or not it's going to be successful. It might not be the curriculum that's the problem. It might be the folks who are tasked with carrying it out. Um, so I'm just curious as to, you know, it's, it, it's hard to dig into the weeds in every program, but um, how are you utilizing both quantitative and qualitative information as well? Um, talking to the parents, talking to the students themselves, talking to the teachers, talking to the folks that are responsible for carrying out this program so that you get the complete story as to whether or not a program is in fact being successful or just it's, it's, uh, it's stopped and it needs just some, some additional help to get it over the hump. So with, for instance, the, the Leader in Me uh, program that we implemented now uh, two years ago, there is an initial stage of getting perception data. Um, what are the perceptions of the users? How are they seeing that play out? Is it effective? We're also looking at outcomes. Is it making a difference uh, in the lives of students? How do folks feel about it? It's very interesting if you look at that information uh, in regards to that report parents across all levels were generally pretty supportive. They felt pretty confident. They felt that the Leader in Me program was accomplishing what they wanted to see. But across different levels, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the use of the program in the sense that the students were seeing it as something that was important in their day was, was varied. I'll go back to something that's probably simplistic, but it's oftentimes very true. Implementation becomes the key lever and how the program is implemented, making sure there's appropriate ch training, and also making sure that you have monitoring systems in place so that you guide that along the way. And if you're not seeing the results you want to make, you can make course corrections as opposed to waiting to the end of an evaluation or waiting to the end of the year. And that kind of leads me or transitions me if, if we're ready to move on to the program monitoring piece that we have in place. So when we talk about program monitoring, um, if you want to go back, yeah, if we, want, if we want to talk about program monitoring, we recognize that not everything can go into formal evaluation. We just don't have the staff or the capacity to be able to do that, so we select what we see as are the key programs that we want to pay attention to and monitor, and in this case, it was many of the programs that we were implementing coming, at, coming into and out of ESSERF. But we also want to give program managers the responsibility. They're carrying fiscal budgets. They have to know what goals they have within those that aren't part of uh, maybe a formal evaluation process, and they can make course corrections along the way. Another way to look at this is summative or formative. The formal evaluations are much more summative in the sense that they traject maybe over a 12-month, 24-, 36-month um, period. The program manager is constantly looking, and it's more formative to inform them along the way. So one of the program managers who was in the formal evaluation process articulated this to me recently. He said, had I been doing stronger program monitoring along the way, I may not have gotten to the point where my program was being eliminated. So again, it goes back to implementation, it goes back to training, and it goes back to monitoring those programs. So that piece is new for us. That program um, monitoring is piece, uh, new, a new piece that we're going to be implementing as we uh, come forward to the year. And then it's also going to be the responsibility, for instance, Dr. Pugh sitting next to me, who's in charge of instruction. She has a set of program um, managers that are going to be doing that program monitoring. Those are going to be discussions that she's going to be having throughout the year with her program managers. When Dr. Pugh and I talk, and I say, what's going on with your program managers and their monitoring, then she's going to report to me the different things that are happening. So we have a chain of accountability there to make sure that you know, what we want to see and how it's playing out is important. And then that's going to also build as we prepare for the budget. 
we can't continue this. We're not seeing the results we want to see. We may need to make adjustments. Or we're seeing some really good results here. How do we prepare and begin to expand for that? I, that so in other words, this will live in Dr. Pugh's shop or? Across all program okay. managers, across all chiefs, and, and um, deputies and uh, you know, uh, chief operating officer, wherever that lies. It's a greater responsibility around the fiscal management and how we're expending resources. And do we need to shift those resources based on the results that we're seeing? Okay. Councilor May. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's uh, great to see this new uh, plan for accountability and transparency, um, and um, and I think that'll be really helpful. And certainly, as we're looking at you know this year's this year's decisions, then seeing uh, even though we don't have this you know red yellow green and, and all the same data that we will have over time which it's great that you all are implementing um continue to hear continuing to hear some of the metrics that using to make the decisions about some of these specific programs um is is helpful and, and important as well um and it's and it's good to hear for example the data um uh, that you're using around leader and me to make some decisions i think that there is you know no shame in in saying like this didn't this didn't um, have all the metrics that we had hoped for in order to defend continued funding. We can't be faulted for trying things, right? We're doing our best out here, and I think that um, you know taxpayers and parents they just want to know that we're not going to keep spending money on things that aren't working, and that's how that's how to be fiscally responsible. And so knowing that um, that that is something that you are doing, the more transparent and clear we can be about that, the more helpful. It is, uh, and so certainly that this system moving forward really gives some clarity there and, and appreciate also incorporating as much of that into our conversations that we're having here um, as, we, as we possibly can. And just a side note around Leader and Me, and as you um, look at potential alternatives to address wellness with our students, that, um, you know, when I look at what is helpful, I mean, I have kids, of course, too, um, but what is helpful for, for wellness, a lot of that is, um, you know, I mean, well, counselors, psychologists, that's a, or that's a huge part of that for our students. Um, what extracurriculars we are making sure that they are linked up with, getting, you know, outside time, having time doing, you know, creative things, the arts, you know, those are all data proven things that help to, that, that help to improve wellness for our students. So, you know, I, I, I hope that that is part of the wellness conversation also, you know, whether a, whether a child is able to define, you know, mental health and understand, you know, the idea of mental health, uh, to me is less important than like how happy are we making them during the school day and are they able to carry that forward into their daily lives. And so I just, I hope that that, uh, that the wellness conversation, you know, kind of includes all of those things as you're looking at programming and bang for your buck. Um, around that as well. Um, and then I also wanted to note that, you know, of course today is about accelerators, but I just wanted to note, you know, for all of us here and for folks watching at home that like a huge proportion of the budget request is around staffing. And so even on times when we're, when we're, you know, the request was of course to focus on accelerators, I just want to make sure that we continue to remind folks um, that, uh, that that is super, that that type of investment is a big part of the budget request and that it's really, really important. And so please feel free to always remind us about the importance uh, of investing in that because that's a big part of the budget decision that we're going to be bringing to the, to the council. We're getting really into the weeds about some of these programs that are, you know, a quarter million, this or that. But the, but playing for staffing, you know, it's, I just want to remind everyone and make sure that we all uh, you know, remember that we've got major understaffing issues. That you know, as as mentioned at the be as you all mentioned at the beginning, we have very competitive salary offers uh, with bonuses in nearby jurisdictions. So you know, hearing about the morale of teachers, you know, uh, inadequate planning time, um, ways in which they're being pulled out of the classroom to cover, like you know, all of those things are 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 things that are difficult to talk about. But it's important that we grapple with them. And you know, as you all have been trying to cobble together, work with what we've got, um, you know, if we need to be providing more resources to fix that, um, please feel free to be very transparent about the struggles that our teachers are facing. Because again, like I said, um, step one, step one is making sure that uh, we have enough staffing in all of these different areas, that caseloads are what they should be, um, and, and that we are uh, ensuring adequate planning time. Thank you. Yeah, it's the three-legged stool. That was slide two of 44. We're on 44. And and I think, like, if we did, uh, if you had some of those chairs, sometimes you have the chairs where the 
one of the stools, one of the legs is thicker because it has to hold more weight. I think the, the teacher one would be the thick one um, right. that, you know, is the lion's share of what your request is and obviously uh, extremely important to, to uh, I really appreciate the point that Ms. Silvestri made at the beginning. Um, you know, 54,000 to 74,000, I think, was the number. And obviously, the blueprint requires us to go up. That's a big gap for someone for 30 minutes down the road. So as far as the uh, D.C. starting teacher pay with their bonus versus what we're doing, I mean, that's, a, that's significant. So I uh, appreciate that. All right. So how many? We're, we're getting close we're all, here. We're right? almost there. All right, we're Hang almost in home. here with all me. Right, all right. All right. And Councilman Mink, I'll just highlight what you said. Uh, we are a people business, so our investment is in people, and I think that's part of the, the theory of action and growing capacity. The last piece that I'll add that's part of, uh, I know you're, you're rushing me, one more piece, because uh, I know this is an emphasis here. The last piece of the accountability measures that we are putting in place is the pathway, and you saw how that arrayed monitoring where students are as they move through that pathway will be another expectation. Uh, as a checkpoint, it's also an awareness to families, and so we'll incorporate that uh, as the third element. So next slide, please. So when we um, started our conversation earlier this morning, one of the things that I mentioned was progress. And while we see students in various different place, places, some performing at a very high level, we want to be able to maintain that, either at or above the benchmark or the standard. But we also recognize that we saw disparities among students. So what is realistic? What is an expectation that we have when we do have those disparities? And how do we make sure that we are making regularly three, five, seven percentage point gains on an annual basis as we monitor students and as they move forward? So we recognize the council's uh, emphasis around improving student achievement and literacy and math. And we feel these accelerators that we have in developed position us to have the ability to do that. These are all aligned with our goals in our strategic plan, and we have incremental goals in the strategic plan that specifically address those areas. We recognize this, too, as it's connected to the Maryland Blueprint as far as making students college, career, and community ready. And then we see this as an important element that we've talked extensively about this morning around accountability and how we are providing uh, services and, and making sure that our resources are being expended in a fiscally responsible way, and we're good stewards of uh, taxpayers' dollars. The last piece that I have for you, next slide, please. Uh, let's, let's move on. I've, I've sort of highlighted this, is we want to hear directly from our customers. So we've captured some statements from some of our students who can tell you a little bit about their experiences and kind of reinforce many of the things that we've talked with you already this morning. So let's play that tape, please. You can hear anyone but you right now. It would be good, right? You know, so I that you're doing a great job. Thank you. Hopefully it'll work. <clears throat> no, I think you got it. I know how to read lots of books. I'm so ready for kindergarten. I learned my number. I love my teacher. Um, after high school, I plan on attending a four-year college, getting my bachelor's degree, and then heading on to medical school. And then in the future, I have to specialize in orthopedic spinal surgery and have that as my career. And um, Walter Johnson has definitely prepared me for that, I feel like. Um, I take advanced science classes like AP Chemistry, next year I'm taking AP Biology. I think it's important to have that belief in yourself and be confident in what you can accomplish because you never know what you're capable of, honestly, like, and always reach out to teachers because they're always here to help you. From being from ESOL 1 to being in honor classes, AP classes, that I did never expect that, and all I did that, I know my effort, but the effort that they did on me, also all the support that they were giving me, also like helped me to, to move on. I want to be a teacher. I want to be someone important in my life. I want to be someone who can uh, help other people. My graduation was so special. My teachers, everyone made it special for me. If you have a dream, work for it. If you wanna be in, if you wanna have a bright future, work for it. Look for help. 
that out there, so many teaching in high school, in college, there's gonna be a lot of help that you can get in, in order to accomplish your dreams. So Council Member Joando, we just, that was our last, we wanted to end it there, but we wanted to end our presentation with hearing from the voices of all the students that represented all of the bars and all of the colors that we saw today. Um, and it's really important when we think about taking our school system to the next level, um, the Board of Education, myself, and all of the staff that represent the work that we do, we do believe that it is going to require every bit of effort from supporting our staff in the ways that they have communicated with us are most meaningful to investing in them as people to really show that we respect and honor the work that they do in supporting our educational infrastructure here in Montgomery County. So thank you for allowing us to really talk about that in detail today. I know we got into a lot of detail, but um, we are hoping that this allows you to better understand the accelerators and um, most importantly, how it's gonna impact the students in the faces that you just saw in the video. Thank you. No, thank you, Dr. McKnight, and thank you to the superintendent uh, and to the school board president, uh, Ms. Silvestri, and to all the staff, Dr. Murphy, it was, you got through that, you did a good job. And the uh, we will talk briefly, I just want to frame, and then we'll talk briefly just to get a quick update on the security numbers as they're related to budget. Obviously, we were gonna we're going to come back, we had a joint session in ENC Public Safety on um, uh, security and safety and the uh, CEO 2.0 and all that and we'll come back to that after uh, budget but just want to make sure we mention the budgetary items for the that you're asking for and the, that you all have requested and included in the board past budget but just to step back a second this session was really important to figure out where we are in math and literacy and what the accelerators are as part of that stool what you're looking for why, why it's embedded in the request, because obviously at our next meeting, uh, we're gonna go over some other items and I'll, I'll ask Mr. Breyer to talk about that, but we will, this committee will make a recommendation about how much of the budget we think should be funded uh, to the full council and that then we'll take it up. And so I think that having this in-depth opportunity to go through why you've, the request was made by the board is important and, and to look at the data. So I appreciate, um, uh, everything that's happened up until this point and, and you all being responsive to our request and we're going to continue to iterate right you know I can tell my colleagues who were not on the ENC committee uh, this is you know we did not always go into this level of detail and I know it's not even the level of detail that some might want <laughs> but we're but we are we are working our way I think in the right direction uh, and what the public wants us to do um, and so as, as a collaborative effort um, yes, I'll, I'll come to you uh, right now. So before we do the security, Councilman Robbins. Yeah, I, I do appreciate. I mean, look, we, this is tough. You know, we've got, um, I, of course, chair the HHS committee. Um, things like our food hubs are also going to be on the reconciliation list. So we've got some really tough challenges um, to, to make as we go through. And as we learned on Tuesday, if nothing changes, we've got a $150 million deficit going into FY25, like with the budget that is passed as proposed by the county executive. So we, we've got to, to you know look all the way through um, and look at things holistically, but it's important through the committee process as we have been doing um, to be able to articulate clearly to our colleagues that we felt we've been heard and I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, I really appreciate Ms. Avesha, your response to the council president, which incorporates a memo that I had written in partnership and cooperation with my colleagues on the committee, because the board plays, as we all know, an extremely important role in all of this. And the board and the council are the two elected bodies who are holistically responsible for supporting children, youth, and families in Montgomery County most directly. So. Um, it's important for both bodies to have information that's been shared today, information that will be shared in the future, um, and an additional resource um, so that you all can inquire, ask, analyze um, from a policy perspective, because it's not just about the evaluation of programs, which is critical, critical. And, and I'm impressed with the, the progress we've made here. 
But we also need to look holistically at policy decisions moving forward and recommendations in partnership um, that I think are get, going to get all of us to a better place. And so um, I appreciate the responsiveness and the recommendation to, to add to additional people who can help with data analysis for the board, which will obviously inextricably linked. Um, and I will have some follow-up questions, not right now, on what that's going to look like. Um, but I think the spirit of the response is exactly what I was hoping for, and I know my colleagues as well, um, which represents real progress. And there likely will be follow-up questions regarding some of the accelerators that have been presented. It was just impossible for us to get through everything in just a few hours. Um, but I, So I will be submitting some additional questions, um, as I'm sure colleagues will as well. Uh, but this is a good, this is, we're, we're heading in the right direction here, as I said, and, and that feels good. Uh, appreciate that. And yeah, just want to note that, you know, we are, uh, we're, we're, t we're on a team here. And uh, I think we all get that. Uh, it's team, our young people doing well. And, and that's, that's what we all are here to do. So uh, really appreciate uh, the conversation today. Uh, so we do have three special appropriations for the CIP that we have to handle, but let's go just, to, I guess, Mr. Hall, are you going to give the update on the security professionals? If you just briefly do that. Yep, wonderful. Thank you. So I'll ask uh, Ms. Dana Edwards, our Chief of District Operations, to come down. She can provide a little bit more detail. Um, but what we're asking for um, in this budget request are 10 additional security personnel who would be deployed directly out to schools. Um, and that is the big piece that is uh, within the operating budget request for next year. But there are many, many things that we are doing above and beyond that. So we have um, some grants that we have applied for, we, we, that we have received, and others that we are applying for that will help us build out uh, our security infrastructure. So that would include uh, security cameras at our buildings. Um, it would also include the uh, uh, the vape uh, detection devices in the bathrooms that we're piloting, uh, potentially um, magnetic locks on some of the doors to you know restrict access to the schools uh, during during school time, uh, and some other pieces there. But it's also just really important to point out that above and beyond our security team who is in our schools every day and doing great work, the security of 211 schools and over 160,000 students requires the, the work, the teamwork of all of the adults in this system. So it isn't just the two security personnel within a middle school or the six or eight or 10 within a high school, but it really is every teacher and every adult, uh, every administrator's responsibility to make sure that our students show up to uh, a safe and welcoming learning environment every day. And so I will turn it over to Ms. Edwards and let her provide a little bit more detail. Good morning and good to see you again. I know we had this conversation like you shared a couple of weeks ago. But just to um, bring it back, as you talked about the accelerator, the 10 security assistants. Last year in our budget, we had a special emphasis in terms of we came back from the pandemic and we really had to determine how do we wrap our hands around our students. So some of the accelerators that went into our budget last year focused on people. We looked in terms of our cluster security coordinators and being able to support our schools. And so now we have nine of those that match with the number of directors for our schools. And so we're able to work more closely with that particular unit. The second piece, when we talked about building capacity today, we do have a coordinator within our security department that really focuses on building the capacity of our security assistants and really thinking about not only the work that they're doing through the lens of race, equity, well-being, but also really be, um, being thoughtful and mindful around what does emergency preparedness look like and how do we convey that to students, staff, and families. So as we come back this year and we continue to look at what are the needs of our buildings, the accelerator that we bring forward today around the 10 security assistants. Um, so this would be directly for our schools thinking about the models that we have. We have 214 security assistants across Montgomery County Public Schools. In our middle schools, the model is usually about two assistants per school. We have about th four middle schools that have three. And so one of the things that we, we have noted since we have returned from the pandemic, we have not released additional security allocations. And so our enrollment is rising. And so we want to be thoughtful around that in terms of the number of students who are in buildings. Yeah. 
The other part is that our square footage is also growing. So this year we have about 26.5 million square um, feet within our building. By the time we build new buildings, do additions over the summer, we'll have 27.5. So the 10 security assistants give us an opportunity, one, to be thoughtful around the coverage within the building and really kind of thinking about keeping that location safe. But one of the critical parts I also want to bring forward, and we had this conversation the last time that we were here, having a trusted adult in the building. And so what's very important for us is that the security assistant is not only seen as someone who brings a level of safety to the building, but also a good partner with families, the community, and building the relationships with students. Let me pause you on that question because, I mean, I got asked by this by the public. We had a security assistant arrested a couple weeks ago for child sex abuse and pornography showing mm -hmm. it to a student. Uh, it's been reported that this, that, that assistant had, been, had a record for armed robbery and sexual solicitation. I'm, I am concerned, as are many parents, how someone with that type of record was allowed into our school and what you're doing to assess. I also read in the packet in preparation for data that there were 34 of the security assistants who haven't completed the necessary training. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to know, was this person one of those and how that interplays? Because I think we, that, that was a significant issue. Yeah, I could speak to that as, as a personnel issue. Um, obviously something um, very unfortunate and very regrettable. Um, the armed robbery charge of this individual was um, as a juvenile and handled through the uh, juvenile court system. And so uh, as we brought that person on, we were able to see that there was a record. We weren't able to see specifically what it was. Um, however, uh, I share your concern and I agree with you that uh, in retrospect, um, it should have been handled differently. And so we are working very closely with our chief of HR and our um, investigations unit uh, to figure out exactly what uh, went into the decision to, to bring this person on. Um, the, there was nothing that would have by policy or by law precluded hiring this person. However, it obviously uh, should have raised uh, red flags uh, and potentially to the point of, of not uh, entering into an employment with this person. And so going forward, we're going to make sure that we strengthen those systems and that anytime anybody um, that we're considering hiring anybody who has any type of criminal record and they're going to be working with our students, uh, that that uh, decision is raised to the highest levels. And so uh, it has not been past practice. It will be future practice that in any circumstance like that, it would raise uh, the decision and the final say would go to the chief of HR. Um, and then if, if necessary, up to, uh, you know, myself as the chief operating officer. Yeah, I will. yeah and, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, I want to come back to this point. Once you develop that policy, you know, I, I passed the ban the box law. I'm, I'm all for second chances and reevaluation of folks who have had or been formerly incarcerated, in, especially if it was a juvenile offense. Uh, but obviously this is the most highest protected. We're talking about trusted adults with kids in schools. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I, I want you to come back. I'll turn to my colleague in a second. But can you address the 34 people who have not gone through the training and what's going, what the process is for that? Absolutely. You're speaking of the state training, Yeah, correct? the state training. The yeah. state training. So um, we, uh, we do monitor the staff who have and have not been through the state training. One of the barriers, and we talk about it with the state, is that the training is offered during the week. And so we do work with the state to be able to identify times which those staff members can take the training in Montgomery County Public Schools, and then we can backfill at their locations to be able so that the schools do have the adequate coverage during the day. So we're very purposeful when we do it. Um, and so we make sure that our staff who do need that training, we try to do it within the first six to eight months of their employment. So we are balancing between the operations of our buildings, sure the needs by the state, but we do stay in very close contact with the state and they have been um, very accommodating in terms of being able to work with Montgomery County. Okay, well keep us, that's something we'll come back to as well. Councilmember Um That was an unsatisfactory answer. Um, I'm sort of shocked that, that you're establishing a new policy now moving forward because that does call into question uh, a, a complete review of your hiring practices, particularly for security positions, 
um, and reevaluating and going back and tracking back records. I know a thing or two about this. As the director of the Recreation Department, we had to complete extensive background checks as a baseline, but we also signed on to an FBI database and so that if somebody were arrested post-hire, we would be notified immediately. Um, it's, it's an issue that is front of, front of mind for many families right now. Um, and so the timing could not possibly be worse, especially with a request for 10 additional positions when it seems as though we don't have the infrastructure in place currently, which doesn't give me a lot of confidence, um, and, and I'm sure by extension a lot of other parents too. And so we will need to revisit this. I know that you all, this ha I'm sure this was um, soul crushing for you as well uh, when, when you heard about this. And I know uh, the seriousness by which the school system takes its role in the safety and security of our students. But hearing that that's the policy moving forward and that wasn't the policy in place previous is totally unacceptable. Um, and so are you doing a review now of those hiring practices based on what should have been the standards before, but appears to be the standards now? Yeah, and I just want to be clear that um, the practice, the longstanding practice has been reviewing uh, or doing background checks both at the state and national level, and that remains in place. And so this was a decision that was made um, you know, again, this was a sealed um, juvenile record. It, it, the decision was made to move forward. In retrospect, obviously, that was a very poor decision. Um, and yes, we will be reviewing, as I mentioned, um, our process across the board. Uh, two of the accelerators that we did put in for HR are around um, fingerprinting, and that would be uh, not for the new employees, which we obviously do, but to strengthen and accelerate the background checks that we do for our existing employees. So if something does uh, occur after the hire date, um, we will uh, be able to um, review those and make sure that we're not missing anything, because I, I fully agree and understand your concern. Uh, this is something that we need to take absolutely and do take absolutely seriously. Got it. Thank you. I just we can't had to raise it. This, we're going to be accountable. We can't talk about adding spots and not talk about the training and, and stuff that's happening in our schools. So I appreciate you, your, your candidate on that. Uh, do you have anything to add on that? Okay. Um, so with that, we will come back to these positions, but thank you for explaining the context of them. I know you need to cover the school buildings. School security assistance and guards are a big part of that. Uh, it's a lot of real estate, uh, and they are. I have met a lot of these individuals. They are providing uh, big time, big time, needs in our schools. I'll give a shout out to Cedric Boatman, who was one of the managers for years, who uh, is uh, a mentor and a good friend of mine and, and was a very good basketball player, Blair, uh, All-American back in the 70s. Um, so with that, uh, Ms. Uh, McGuire, can we turn to the special appropriations? Yes, thank you. So that then con that for the CIP items, excuse me. I yeah, that'll conclude our review of MCPS math and literacy for today. We're going to go, we're going to approve these appropriations and then uh, have you all on your way. Dr. McKnight, did you have anything you wanted to add at the end here? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you on May 4th. Um, go ahead. So there, thank you. There are, so this is items three through five on the committee agenda. There are three supplemental appropriations um, that have come through the board to the council. Um, I would like to emphasize these are all non-county funds. These are all um, a combination of federal and state grants. Um, Favorite part of my job, appropriating <laughs> federal and state money. It is part of the council's job, absolutely. And yes, we're very happy to see outside funds come through. Um, so again, we have three supplemental appropriations. They are grouped together. They went to public hearing. Um, uh, on Tuesday of this week there were no speakers and they are scheduled for action next week as well um, there is a supplemental appropriation uh, related to Individuals with Disabilities Act um, grant that's 1.6 million dollars there is a supplemental appropriation for just over 1 million dollars related uh, it's um, related to homeless children and youth uh, for part of the emergency relief fund. And there is also a supplemental appropriation for $350,000 related to um, an additional electric bus as part of the um, grants through the state. Um, so again, council staff recommends um, approval of these supplementals. Uh, just wanted to flag them certainly for the committee's awareness and if you had any questions, but again, they do not involve county funding. Any questions on these? Yep. We, we, uh, without objection, those are approved. Um, so, all right, well, we are uh, going to wrap up today, and we'll be back on May 4th. 
uh, and look forward to the continued conversation and appreciate the school system and, and the board uh, and staffs. Uh, great packet as always on a very dense set of topics. So uh, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.